Welcome, everyone, to this first council meeting. Um, welcome. Oh, I was told there were going to be many people up in the public gallery, but uh, anyway. Welcome, colleagues. Welcome, officers. Please be seated. So welcome to the first meeting of the City Council for the new municipal year. Uh, moving on to the business of the agenda this evening, can we go on to item number one, which is apologies for absence. Lord Mayor, we've heard apologies from councillors Beecham, Hindmarsh, Higgins, Lawson, George Patterson, Sharon Patterson and Wright. Can we accept those apologies? Okay. Uh, can we move on to item number two, the minutes? Does the council agree the minutes of the meeting held on the 7th of March 2018? And on the meeting held of the 4th of April 2018? They agreed. And the annual meeting of council, which was held on the 23rd of May, 2018. At the annual meeting of council, I offer congratulations to all members present on their election on the 3rd of May. There were some councillors who were unable to be with us at that meeting, so I'm wondering, with your indulgence, if we could welcome those councillors this evening. Um, in um, order of ward, there would be Councillor Tom Woodock. Would you like to? Pardon? Okay. Councillor Jane Byrne. Uh, can we? <laughs> Councillor Jerry Beating, uh, Keating. No. Nope. He, he's sorry. He will be somewhere shortly, I'm sure. And Councillor Wendy Young. Thank you. Item number three: official announcements. On behalf of the council, I would like to congratulate all those with a northeast connection who have been recognised in the birthdays honours list. In particular, may we give special congratulations to Councillor and former Lord Mayor Davy Wood, who was awarded the CBE for Political and Public Service. Oh, sorry, David, would you like to say something? Yes. Lord Mayor, can I thank you very much for those kind words. And I'll, I'll just be very brief. I'd just like to say a thank you to everyone who's been in contact with me, um, congratulating on the, on the award. When I got the letter, I was sure it was meant for someone else. Um, but no, no, but, but there you are. But, um, I would like to thank um, some people in particular, Lord Mayor. Certainly, um, my old colleague, John Stoke, Councillor John Stoke of Walker, uh, Nick Brown, the Member of Parliament, who was a former member of uh, Council for, for Walker. But most of all, I'd like to thank um, the, help in, the help I've received over the years, Councillor Margaret Wood, who without this, is, I would never have managed to last 30 years on the Council <laughs> or anything else. So, uh, thank you very much. On behalf of the council, can I welcome you all who have just come into the public gallery? We're just um, going on to item number three now on the agenda, if you have them with you. Official announcements. 
further. On behalf of the Council, um, I would like to offer condolences to the family and friends of Alderman David Brooke, who passed away recently. Former Liberal Democrat Councillor Brooke served as a ward member in Castle Ward and Parkland's Ward in between the years 1982 to 2008. We have also been informed, sadly, of the death of former Labour councillor Eric Wade, who served as a member in Castle Ward in the 1970s. Again, on behalf of the council, I would like to offer condolences to his family and friends. And can we ask, I ask the council please to stand for a minute's silence as a mark of respect. Thank you. Item number four, correspondent. Formal correspondence has been received from the Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government, the Department for Transport and the Home Office. Does the Council agree to receive the correspondence? Thank you. Okay. Petitions, item number five. We have received two petitions. First, can I call upon Councillor Jackie Robinson to present a petition regarding provision of a bus service through Meadow Rise? Thank you, Lord Mayor. <clears throat> we are the undersigned petition Newcastle City Council to provide a bus service through Meadow Rise as there is a now a large number of residents who are senior citizens sorry, and a large number of residents who are lesser abled. The X87 and X88 run frequently and to reroute them through Meadow Rise would be the ideal s solution. We have 289 signatures. Thank you. Can I ask Councillor Ainsley, Cabinet Member, to respond please? And many thanks, Councillor Robinson, uh, for presenting this petition to Council. And while I can understand and appreciate the views expressed by the residents of Meadow Rise, it's important that everyone understands that we have no control over the routes that the X87 or X88 take. These are commercially operated services, and as such, Stagecoach North East determine the routes, fares and frequency. I will take this matter up directly with the Managing Director of Stagecoach North East, uh, who recently wrote to all councillors and with whom I'm meeting in the near future. When writing to you all, he made it clear how much funding is being lost by providing additional services and to keep to existing timetables, let alone introducing new routes or diversions. He also made it clear that if we are to continue making changes to prioritise bus, bus measures, that the funding currently being used to provide extra services on some routes could be directed to make improvements elsewhere. Um, you know, through the work I'm overseeing in relation to air quality, which is one of the most significant public health issues we face in this country, we need to continue to work in partnership with bus operators to see improvements to routes, the quality of their fleet, and how we ensure more people choose to use active and sustainable modes of transport. It's worth noting that when a similar issue was raised in Fenham about changing, changes being made to the route of the number 32, um, that other services were redirected at Stagecoach's next review to ensure people could access local facilities, which again demonstrates the importance of us you know, representing the needs of local communities and also working in partnership with, with transport providers. 
As I've said, I will raise the potential rerouting of the X87 and the X88 with Stagecoach, and I'll get back to you in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ainsley. Does the Council agree to receive the petition? Okay, thank you. Can I call on Councillor Stone to present a petition regarding parking problems on Hayden Grange, please? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, the petition is from about 150 residents of the Hayden Grange estate, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll summarise the, the, uh, the, the message. Uh, residents of Hayden Grange wish to register concern and frustration at the ongoing and worsening problem of university parking on our estate, which has spread to many streets and is a cause of inconvenience and even confrontation. We are frustrated that parking facilities are available on campus and the nearby Coach Lane car park, but our estate is being used as a means of avoiding pay parking or, parking or paying for a campus permit. We therefore request the City Council and University of Northumbria work together to address this problem by considering implementing appropriate measures such as suspending parking charges during the day at the Coach Lane car park, which we consider will be a more practical and cost-effective solution than residents-only parking. Can I now ask Councillor Ainsley um, to respond, please? Thanks to Councillor Stone for presenting this petition on behalf of the residents of Hayden Grange. Uh, we've been asked to look at parking issues on this estate a number of times in the past, and parking has been evident at the entrance to the estate where it does not impact directly on the front <coughs> residential um, properties. And some parking has been observed which does, does have an effect on residential properties closest <coughs> to the entrance to the estate. Council has done some parking assessments in the past which have not shown a level of commuter parking sufficiently high to meet the Council's established criteria to justify the implementation of a permit parking scheme. But given the petition, we will arrange to undertake a further survey of parking to determine the, if, to see whether the impacts worsened and, and if the criteria may now be met. We'll undertake to do this in the autumn at the start of the new academic year when, when the students have all returned. Um, as this is when you know parking uh, issues are more likely to be most evident and give us the best opportunity, opportunity to, ta to determine whether parking restrictions are necessary. I would note that we wouldn't support, um, we wouldn't be in support of the removal of charges in the car park opposite Hayden Grange as it could impact on the availability of parking for service users at the nearby sports fields which was the reason for the car park in the first place. So I'll, I will get back to Councillor Stone. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ainsley. Does Council agree to receive the petition? Thank you. Item number six, public question time. We have received a request from Sam Cordery to ask a question at Council. Uh, can I invite you uh, to the lectern, please, Sam? Uh, you have five minutes, five minutes to uh, address. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the Migration Asylum Justice Forum, for whom I'm speaking today, um, applauds the policy and the action against forced bedroom sharing for asylum seekers that Newcastle City Council took in 2017 and we're sure that the council shares our frustration and disappointment that the first tier property tribunal upheld Joe Mast's appeal against the overcrowding notices served by the Environmental Health Department. Moving forward, we note that the um, that new HMO regulations will come into effect on the 1st of October in this year and, we, and that these will enable councils to set room size regulations and occupancy numbers as well as requiring contractors providing asylum accommodation or any other accommodation for that matter um, for five or more occupants of more than one household to apply for HMO licences from Newcastle Council. Um, so this will mean many, many of Joe Mass' current properties will require licences. We understand that Sheffield Council were successful in ending forced bedroom sharing in their city by amending the HMO uh, room size regulations, increasing the room sizes required for two adults to share a bedroom from 10 square metres to 13 square metres. Given that Newcastle City Council will need to review their HMO licensing to comply with the new regulations this autumn, will the Council seek to follow Sheffield Council's lead 
in amending room size requirements? And will the Council refuse to issue HMO licences to properties where forced bedroom sharing of unrelated adults is taking place? Will the Council make no bedroom sharing a condition of HMO licences through the new powers afforded them? The Migration and Asylum Justice Forum is keen to work with asylum seeker residents in supporting the identification of properties where bedroom sharing is taking place. We are concerned that action is taken as soon as possible before contractors apply for the new licences, which they are required to do before October. And a final and related part to this question is that we also recognise there's been a change in the elected officials due to the May elections. We met with Councillor Jane Strether and other elected representatives and officials in December to discuss issues surrounding HMO licences for hostel accommodation for women and children in the west end of Newcastle. With the new HMO regulations, is there scope for introducing local policies against the housing of children in larger scale HMOs? This was a possibility that councillors and officials were interested in pursuing in December, though we, aware, we are aware that Councillor Strether stepped down from her post. Thank you. Could I ask for a response from Councillor McCarty, Cabinet Member, please? Thank you very much, Lord Mayor, and thank you to Sam and team for uh, bringing what we think um, uh, across the whole of City Council is a really important issue in our city. Um, as you have said, Newcastle City Council have been really proactive in trying to do all we can to stop forced uh, bedroom sharing. The Council, as you've mentioned, took action under the existing powers to try and enforce this policy um, with the Government Asylum Seeker Contractor, Joe Mast. The action was appealed to the housing, the first tier housing tribunal that you've mentioned and we were unsuccessful imposing that as a standard. Um, the, the decision which is pretty shocking Lord Mayor was that um, we were only able to enforce standards in accordance with the legislation that were, was drafted in the 1950s. So clearly our expectations now are very different to um, nearly 70 years ago. Um, there was acknowledgement in their uh, review that these standards did not reflect uh, current expectations or guidance that had been developed by local authorities. Um, you've mentioned that there is um, new, there is draft legislation out there so that um, we will uh, be enabled as council to set minimum bedroom standards for houses in multiple occupation and we will be able to introduce limits on how many people can live in each of those bedrooms. Um, I can assure you that we will be um, looking at those minimum standards and we will try and apply the toughest um, requirements that we possibly can to um, support the policy that we have already um, uh, clearly adopted. Um, the standards will apply to all landlords seeking new licences, so that's a tricky issue uh, about existing uh, properties. Um, and uh, anyone with existing properties would be given 18 months, so you know, potentially there would be um, a shift from where we currently are over a period of time. Um, but uh, I understand that the new standards mean that landlords might face a fine of up to £30,000 if they don't comply um, with rules that we will uh, then enforce. So I can assure you all that we will adopt the new standards. Um, what we need to do though is test what we are trying to do um, and, and seek legal guidance so that we are assured. I think we made the right decision in, in taking um, Joe Mast um, you know, challenging them through the, the tribunal process. Uh, but of course, that's a cost to the council. We don't really want to be getting into that again. Um, so we've got to ensure that we um, test what we're trying to do legally uh, before that is agreed. And I, I will assure you that we are trying to do that. Um, we do know that we've got to tackle anyone who seeks to exploit tenants who live in our city by letting overcrowded properties and not with, the, uh, with inappropriate facilities really to meet their needs. And um, I'm assuming that's the visit that you talked about when you went with Jane uh, to look at a particular HMO in the West End. So, um, Lord Mayor, I assure Council and our colleagues that we will continue to lobby government to make sure that their contracts are appropriate and meet our expectations um, and respect for those who are seeking 
uh, asylum and refuge in our very welcoming city uh, and hope that addresses uh, your points and uh, Lord Mayor just to place on record for council I'm very happy to meet colleagues uh, if that would be helpful in the future thank you very much thank you Councillor McCarty would you like to respond um, yeah I think um, the Migration and Justice Forum, we're always prepared to meet the Council and work with the Council on this issue. Obviously, we're in touch with a lot of asylum seekers who are living this situation day to day and are you know, frustrated um, with, with, with the situation that they're faced and you know, can appreciate what the Council has tried to do, but are also looking to Sheffield and thinking, well, what, what could happen here that you know, um, could, could follow the, the footsteps of Sheffield. I guess um, that meeting would be useful for understanding the differences between, you know, the council being able to, uh, to apply guidance and then, you know, what that means in relation to the housing law. And um, so we would definitely um, pursue that. And we're particularly um, interested in, in doing whatever we can or getting statement, you know, a strong statement from council prior to the... Um, the uh, procurement and the termination of the procurement process of the new asylum housing contracts which are due to finish this um, autumn um, and we we understand that some of the current contractors have got a good stake in them um, you know that the potential new um, contracts as well so we're very keen to try and do as much as we can before those new contracts which are 10-year contracts come into place I don't know if you want to say anything I suppose I would just mention that although um, you've said that you would be happy to kind of in a way take the role that Jane Strether had before um, in liaising with us about this, in particular in relation to the issue about children um, and the way that they are being housed, I think um, it would be really interesting to hear how the council plans to look at that difference because I think that is a very critical issue really in terms of how children are being housed and I, I would believe that there would certainly be scope under like looking at Children's Rights Act and things like that um, to look at certainly bringing in policies that would protect children's rights to live um, in decent housing and that is not overcrowded. So I would just potentially ask for that to be specifically also kind of highlighted as a separate, slightly separate issue to the, the rest of the, the bedroom sharing issue. Thank you. <coughs> Item number seven, the 2017 Education and Skills Annual Report. Can I call on Councillor Casey to introduce the report, please? Thank you, Chair. This report is a snapshot in time. And colleagues will be aware that time has not stood still since this report was published in May. That said, I would like to highlight the continued strong performance of our nursery, primary and special schools while commending the work of staff and schools along with families to address ongoing concerns around attainment at secondary level. This is being done in large part through the Promise Board, which is the body steering a sector-led model of school improvement in Newcastle, involving all schools, regardless of sponsor or model of governance, along with wider partners who have an interest in education. <coughs> Priorities for the current year in education include work to further the Send Inclusion agenda in Newcastle, following on from the anticipated findings of the High Needs Review and ongoing discussions with schools, children and families. We also look forward to the anticipated benefits of the devolution agenda. We will continue our efforts to provide adequate school places of a high, uh, of a high quality throughout the city to keep up with growing demand from local communities. We will also continue to work toward wider education and, uh, educational inclusion and attainment, including work to ensure that every child feels safe and welcome in school, and that poverty or other circumstances, such as being a looked after child, or having spent time in care, or being a young carer, are not a barrier to uh, accessing education, or to doing well in education, and progressing on to work or further study. This supports our efforts to become a UNICEF child-friendly city. Thank you, colleagues. Happy to take questions. Thank you. I've had uh, notification of six uh, members who wish to speak about the report and ask questions. Can I call upon first Councillor Holland, please? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, my question is, uh, Tory cuts are obviously starving our school of the funding required to deliver a first-class education. 
Labour Party is very clear that they will invest in schools and make them democratically accountable so they can provide an inclusive and quality education service for all children. Labour has pledged to reverse the cuts and not waste money on free schools or grammar schools and forcing schools to become academies. In light of the £9 million wasted locally at the Discovery School, the academy, and the devastating lack of funding for local schools, I'd like to ask Councillor Casey what she and council officers would have done with that huge amount of cash. Thank you. Do you wish to respond, Councillor Casey, at the end of the questions? Okay, thank you. Um, can I call on Councillor Ashby, please, to... Thank you, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I particularly uh, uh, would like to thank uh, Councillor Casey for the report, uh, for all the, uh, the officers who uh, were involved uh, in, in preparing it, and in particular because I want to talk about uh, education and skills post-16, which is on pages 18 and 19 of the report, or... 65 to 66 for the agenda, uh, those businesses and organisations offering or getting involved with apprenticeships uh, and work experience. Um, within the report, it says that, uh, that the apprenticeships were offered, have been offered to, uh, uh, to council staff, um, and, and I would be interested to know how many that we, uh, as a council, were able to provide as opposed to uh, those that were provided uh, by ex externally. I realise you might not have access to all this information immediately, and you obviously would be happy for you to write to me separately. Um, uh, I, I'm a very rather small brain, and I don't actually understand what the achievement rate means, although I do notice that we're better than the national average on that, which I hope is a good thing. Uh, but when thinking about the apprenticeships, I, the one thing that did slightly worry me was that Newcastle's success rate for completion uh, of apprenticeships, 62.5% uh, is lower than the national average, and I wonder if we have any reason uh, uh, as to why, why that should be. Um, I also note that the proportion of 19-year-olds in Newcastle who achieved levels two or three qualifications in 2016 were below the national average uh, and, and required improvement, and I wondered if you can now or, or later tell us about the policies uh, and programmes that we will be implementing to improve those rates. Uh, and I was particularly concerned that, uh, to see the levels uh, of 19-year-olds uh, of with special education needs and disabilities um, who achieved a level three qualification, which is uh, slightly more than half the national average. Um, and I wondered if, if there is yet any clarity about the impact of devolving the edu adult education budget to the North of Time Combined Authority. Thank you, Councillor Aspie. Uh, can I call on Councillor Postlethwaite now, please? <coughs> thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'd like to thank Councillor Casey for the report and ask her if she would um, provide some more detail on the SEND inclusion agenda, please. Um, I'd like to know how we're ensuring that every child in the city is getting the best education and that, and how they're getting the right support for them. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Avery. Uh, so I was fortunate enough to, to go to two very good schools, one which was a very good school at the time in the city. I went to West Chesham Primary School uh, in Heaton Manor. And West Chesham in particular has had a long history of taking children from a large variety of backgrounds, particularly uh, refugee children and uh, particularly refugee children whose parents work at university and has had special commendation for working with uh, ESL children, uh, that is children who speak English as a second language. So I was wondering if there's anything else that uh, Councillor Casey would like to pull out uh, about excellence or areas of improvement that we might need in terms of um, how refugee children, children from different backgrounds, immigrant children and children from all the diverse communities in Newcastle are doing well. Uh, Sydney, it's been my impression that we've done uh, relatively well in comparison to other, uh, other cities and have, for example, lower rates of segregation. Uh, but if she has any further comments, that's what we'll be interested to hear. Thank you. Councillor Cott. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor, and uh, thank you very much, Councillor 
Casey, for your report. Uh, since these reports have been coming in this format, I found them very accessible, um, and I wish you a successful municipal year as portfolio holder um, for the benefit of children and young people in the city. Um, I have a number of questions that I would like to ask. I gather, uh, the first question, and I gather there, there is uh, there, there's perhaps some change in senior officer support in, in your portfolio area, and given that this is an area of great uh, need, um, I'm just wondering whether you can say anything about new arrangements that are being put in place. So that's one question. Another question, um, I'm pleased that there are a number of improvements in key areas, but um, I, I admire your um, aspiration to narrow inequalities um, and to deal with the narrowing a, a gap a, agenda, but we still see some big inequalities and growing inequalities in areas such as SEND, uh, post-16 uh, looked after children in terms of meets, um, school attendance, um, various measures against our statistical neighbours. Um, what are you going to be doing to try and address some of those things in the next year? Of course, I should mention GCSEs as well, but I think there's a major issue. Um, another issue uh, I wanted to raise was um, in relation to uh, school places. Um, uh, it leads on actually from Councillor Holland's uh, question. Uh, what contingencies are put in place by the City Council to deal with schools that close in um, unexpectedly contingencies in terms of school place planning? Um, what contingencies do you put in place? Um, uh, another question. Um, you mentioned in your report about uh, building relationships or opportunities for relationships with the north of Tyne. Uh, obviously, we're going to have some new governance arrangements around that. What might that look like? Maybe it's too early to say, but maybe you could give some indication. Um, and um, the other issue, um, given that we do live in a very mixed education environment, different schools, different statuses, uh, different governance arrangements, how are you going to manage that complex web of relationships in the next few years? Um, and um, is the council working with the private sector or only uh, state uh, schools? Thank you. And finally, Councillor John Paul Stevenson. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I was worried you were just going to ask mine there. Um, uh, thanks to Councillor Casey for the incredible report, and, and particularly to all the staff who work in this area. It's an incredibly, incredibly important uh, role they do. Uh, my question is, can you explain the role of the virtual school in supporting looks after children to access education? Thank you. Um, I now call on Councillor Casey to reply, answer these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, I suppose in reverse order, uh, the virtual school is, uh, is a statutory body um, which monitors the education of all looked after children whether they're in, being educated in Newcastle or whether they're being educated in another authority. So as you can imagine, that's quite challenging at times. We place most of our looked after children locally, but some of them are very far away and the team do a fantastic job, uh, which has been recognized by Ofsted and, and elsewhere. Um, and making sure that those children get the best educational outcomes possible, uh, which is not always easy as, as has been highlighted uh, in recent reports, um, including one published today, uh, which was more about children who had been in the care system, but it's the same, same kind of issue. Uh, and yeah, making, making a plan for each child individually and trying to keep that child in school and advocating for that child if there's a risk of exclusion. And it's just a, a really good team. And yeah, we're very lucky to have a good virtual school. Uh, Th uh, thanks to my colleague, Councillor Cott, for his kind remarks. Um, in terms of, obviously, you'll all be aware at this stage that Dean, Dean Jackson has left to go back to Northumberland. In a way, that's not necessarily a bad thing if that means that he's still involved in the North of Time devolution agenda. Uh, we do anticipate recruiting into that post. But uh, in the meantime, we have a fantastic team that Dean helped build. That team is continuing to grow. Uh, so I'm, I'm not, 
I'm not overly concerned about what might happen while we don't have somebody in that role, but in the long term, yes, of course, we want a head of education. Um, uh, in terms of narrowing the gap, uh, yeah, all of, all of the things you've mentioned are, are very valid concerns. Uh, they're not just concerns for Newcastle, they're <coughs> concerns nationally, but that doesn't mean that the fact that we don't have great figures on them doesn't matter. Um, some of that will hopefully be resolved through the North of Tyne agenda, um, because there are issues for our neighbouring authorities as well, uh, and I'm conscious that I'm running out of time, but um, a lot of it can be traced back to early primary school or even earlier than that, and it's about getting that support in there as early as possible. Um, school places, uh, each school in existence is supposed to have a certain number of places in reserve. Uh, that's a national school planning thing. Uh, so in that sense, that's our contingency, but unfortunately, since we can't open schools ourselves, as I'll get onto in my, in my motion, we can't really, there's a, a limit to what we can do to plan. Um, complex web of relationships among different sponsors, you're, you're absolutely right. That's what the Promise Board is there to do. So the Promise Board is open to all schools, regardless of who their sponsor is or how they got set up. Um, in terms of supporting children from different backgrounds, um, many of our schools do a fantastic job of that. I'd highlight Excelsior, uh, who have done a fantastic job of reaching out to particularly the Roma and Traveller communities. Um, am I out of time? Councillors have asked, are you, are you happy for I'm the... I'm happy to email people. To, to email them. And in fact, yeah. I'll email everybody since everybody was probably interested in the answers. Is that okay? Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor Thank Casey. You. Thank you. Item number eight, questions by members. We have received two questions marked for written reply. These with the response have been circulated and are also displayed in the foyer. Appointments. Are the appointments agreed as set out on the agenda, supplemental agenda? Thank you. And we move on to item number 10, notice of motion. The National Health Service 70th anniversary notice of motion. I call upon Councillor Kilgore to move the motion, seconded by Councillor McCarty. Thank you, Lord Mayor. As I'm sure colleagues are aware, the NHS was launched in July 1948 by the then Health Secretary in Iron Bevan, the Park Hospital in Manchester, now known as Trafford General Hospital. For the first time, hospitals, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, opticians and dentists were brought together under one umbrella to provide services which were free at the point of delivery, built on the principle that healthcare should be available to all on the basis of need and not ability to pay. The NHS has delivered huge medical advances and improvements to the nation's health. It has almost eradicated diseases such as polio and diphtheria, pioneered new treatments previously unthought of such as organ transplants, and continues to innovate and evolve, making use of modern research and technology, not least the hospitals in our own region. I'm sure every one of us in the chamber tonight has a tale to tell about life-changing, if not life-saving treatment that we, or a loved one, has benefited from. It is appalling then to see deliberate underfunding of services, unacceptable increases in waiting times, staff shortages, a series of winter crises, and the stealthy privatisation and contracting out of the NHS under the current government. The Prime Minister, presumably anticipating public scrutiny on such a significant birthday, has promised the NHS in England an additional £20 billion a year by 2023, an average annual rise of 3.4%. Of course, this is significantly less than the 6% annual growth rate the NHS saw under Labour governments between 1997 and 2010, and less than the 4% a year increase NHS England Chief Executive Simon Stevens was reportedly asking for. £20 billion is, of course, still a significant sum of money, and any increase in NHS funding is to be welcomed. 
but this is simply the bare minimum needed to keep services going in the face of eight years of unprecedented underfunding and a year-on-year -year increase in demand and cost pressures. Of course, this year also marks the 70th anniversary of social care. As we know, adult social care nationally faces a huge funding gap in excess of £2 billion by 2020. So for the government to continue to impose cuts on local government is a false economy borne out by the sharp rise in emergency readmissions for, for potentially preventable conditions across England. A fact which you'd think would lead to reinvestment in community-led, cost-effective prevention services delivered by local councils rather than punitive government cuts and stopgap temporary funding. Adult social care is essential to reducing pressures on the NHS and needs to be put on an equal footing to the health service. But since the long-awaited green paper has been postponed yet again, I'm not holding my breath that it will receive a similar birthday present. Newcastle Council is keen to continue to work with, the NH with our NHS partners locally, but we need urgent funding to invest in effective prevention work to reduce the need for people to be admitted to hospital in the first place. And let's not forget that cuts to public health grants to councils have also been cut by £60 million nationally between 2015-16 and 2019-20, further reducing our ability to, to fund prevention programmes such as smoking cessation programmes. It's essential then that this Conservative government addresses the chronic underfunding of both the NHS and adult social care systems as a matter of urgency. Lord Mayor, the founding of the NHS remains one of the Labour Party's proudest achievements. I'm sure colleagues across the chamber will join me in thanking NHS staff for all that they do, often in very difficult circumstances, and in wishing the NHS a very happy birthday. Can I call on Councillor McCarthy to second the motion? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll second and reserve the right to speak in the debate. Thank you. Thank you. We have received an amendment... Um, to this motion. Can I call upon Councillor Hall to move an amendment, please? Seconded by Councillor Haddad. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, the motion proposed by Councillor Kilgower is a welcome and timely reminder of the incredible work of the NHS and its legacy in this region and across the country. It also provides a sharp focus for us on the current financial constraints placed on this institution by the Conservative government at a time when pressure on the healthcare system is constantly increasing and we are supportive of the motion. The amendment we propose does not seek to dilute or alter the core message of this motion but to enrich it with a positive vision of what we can do now as a council and what we should aspire to in the future in support of our NHS on its 70th birthday. Firstly, what we can do now. Lord Mayor, between now and the end of September alone, there are at least 16 different national NHS campaigns ranging from Blood Cancer Awareness Month to Genes for Genes Day. The Council can take an active part in promoting or participating in any of these campaigns and may well be involved in some already. The amendment seeks to affirm or reaffirm our commitment to support these campaigns wherever we are able as our way of actively celebrating the 70th anniversary. The amendment draws attention in particular to Health Information Week, as of all the campaigns in the near future, this is a campaign that is specifically directed towards local councils. It, is all, it also occurs at the same time as the anniversary being the week of the 2nd to the 8th of July. Health Information Week is a national campaign originating in the West Midlands that seeks to promote and increase the provision of healthcare information, such as information on living with cancer, healthy diet, sexually transmitted infections. The campaign encourages local information providers, such as public libraries and information centres, to work with the NHS to produce literature and create displays to increase public awareness of the availability of healthcare information in these spaces. It is intrinsically linked to the work of the Council in providing access to a broad range of information at our libraries and information centres and is something that we feel we must support. Secondly, to what we should aspire to. The motion makes a great point of the support provided by local authority social care services to the NHS and also of the disconnect in the relationship between the NHS and adult social care, in particular in terms of funding. The amendment offers a vision of, for what the government could do 
to give us and other local authorities the power to correct this, namely to combine healthcare and social care budgets and to devolve them to local or regional authorities. Now, this work has already begun in Manchester, thanks to their devolution deal. But the government has to take a nationwide approach with equal availability of powers to all devolved regions. The North of Tyne devolution deal is a good start, but we must urge the government for ourselves and others to stop making piecemeal deals with different regions that create further inequalities in our country and to take a nationwide approach. And healthcare is the place to start. In this way, we as local representatives and not central government would be empowered to take the decisions that will improve the health and welfare of our great city. Lord Mayor, this amendment seeks to build on the excellent foundation of the motion to create a vision of action for the Council, both for now in celebrating the NHS's 70th anniversary and for the future by urging the government to combine and devolve social and health care, social and health care budgets to improve outcomes and to better meet the needs of the residents of Newcastle. Lord Mayor, thank you, and I submit the motion to, uh, amendment to the Chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hall. Um, that would be your maiden speech, so well done so quickly to be doing it. Can I call on Councillor Hudder to uh, second the amendment? I'd like to second it and um, reserve the right to speak later. Thank you. Thank you. Can I call on Councillor Schofield, uh, please? Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm really delighted to support Councillor Kilgale's motion celebrating the 70th anniversary of the NHS. This has made healthcare free and universal for everybody. Let's not forget, too, it is the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which enshrined the right to healthcare, housing and welfare on which the NHS is based. As Councillor Kilgore has said, it's sad that, um, and has made clear, it's very sad that it's necessary now to raise deep concerns about the future fragility of the NHS. Under this Tory government, the provision of health and social care is suffering both a profound funding and organisational challenge. Social care is essential to the integrated health care system, but as the Tory government funding to local authorities has been progressively reduced, They've had to narrow the criteria under which people can receive social care. In consequence, for example, since 2005, there's been a 20% fall in the numbers of elderly people receiving community home-based care, 4% fall in residential care, and a 6% fall in nursing home care. Let's be clear, the government's pressure to change the criteria for eligibility to social care provision hasn't reduced the need for care. It simply conceals it. And it puts local authorities in the very difficult position of having to ration who gets what and how. At the same time, as a recent report shows, the region faces profound difficulties of recruiting and retaining specialised and general staff needed to provide health and social care. Now, exactly the same approach is to be employed in the provision of health care with the introduction of US-style accountable care organisations. They have decision-making powers on who is eligible for health care and what sort of care. The language around accountable care organisation has changed and we now talk of integrated care systems and services. But as far as the Tories are concerned, and we must challenge them, these systems will have the same job to do, just cut admissions to hospitals in the region. Emergency admissions are to be cut by 15%, elective or planned admissions will be cut by 10%. How are these cuts to be achieved? Again, by changing the criteria by which people will be admitted to hospital. As in social care, this will not reduce the demands according to which people's needs, it will merely conceal it. In order to stem this downward spiral in the provision of health care, we need to support the NHS reinstatement bill, which seeks to reverse 25 years of marketisation in the NHS by abolishing the purchaser-provider split, ending contracting and re-establishing public bodies and making services accountable to local communities. What a wonderful birthday present for the NHS that would be.
Thank you, Councillor Schofield. Um, can I call on Councillor Taylor, please? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Could I firstly declare a personal interest as an employee of the Newcastle Hospitals Foundation Trust? Uh, colleagues, I've worked in the NHS for almost all my working life, and I'm hugely proud of what the NHS achieves. As a doctor, I can't overstate how important it is to me to be able to offer my patients the best treatments available without having to ask how much they can afford to pay. Yet, as the motion says, the NHS is facing many difficulties, including lack of funding, loss of staff and increasing debt. The impact of Jeremy Hunt's attack on junior doctors has been devastating, with over 50% of doctors not taking up a training post when they complete their basic training. Many are going to New Zealand or Australia. Others are giving up medicine altogether. Of course, many will come back to train as a GP or a consultant at a later time. But when I think of the enthusiasm and excitement of medical students when they apply to study medicine, it is just so sad that much of this is lost once they qualify. And the loss of the bursaries for student nurses has been just as damaging. As I may not get the chance to speak about this later, I also want to talk about the effect of leaving the EU. One of the most important groups of EU migrants are those working in the NHS. Doctors, nurses, midwives, radiographers and many other paramedical staff. It's no exaggeration to say the NHS would be lost without them. Just within my own department at Freeman Hospital, there are doctors from Germany, Italy, Romania, Bulgaria, Austria and Poland, a Greek nurse, an Italian housekeeper on one of our wards and a Romanian physicist. But 10,000 EU health workers left the NHS in the 12 months after the Brexit vote, an increase on 22% on the previous year and 42% on the year before that. Meanwhile, the number of health workers joining the NHS from the EU is shrinking. There's been a drop of nearly 90% in the number of nurses from the EU registering to work in the UK, and a 94% in the drop in the number of, e of European midwives in the year after the vote. As the motion states, currently the NHS has 100,000 vacancies, 35,000 of which are for nurses. And of course, it's not just staffing problems that will affect the NHS. A trade deal will determine how much we can keep the benefits of drawing medicines and devices across the EU. The agreements we reach on customs and whether we have time to prepare will determine whether delays and disruptions hit hospital finances and vital supplies. If the cost of Brexit is a broken NHS, it can't be the right path for our country. The extra funding recently announced for the NHS is of course welcome, but there needs to be clarity about where the money will come from. And the IFS and the King's Fund have said that it won't be enough to deliver a modern NHS that treats people with mental and physical health equally. Theresa May has called for a more effective NHS, but this will be impossible to achieve when none of the new funding is going towards social care, public health or prevention. This is not the long-term plan that the NHS and social care need. To achieve this, the government must accept the need to work with others to find a solution which offers sustainable funding. The Liberal Democrats are the only party putting forward an immediate 1p increase in income tax, which would raise an additional 6 billion a year for the NHS and social care, and many people throughout the UK support that policy. And the situation for adult social care is dire and unsustainable. The government must come forward as soon as possible with a solution to the funding crisis and ideas for how health and social care can be effectively and properly integrated to provide a seamless service for residents who need care. This can't be fudged any longer. Lord Mayor, I urge colleagues to support the amendment and the motion. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Um, Councillor Hobson. is on the council's agenda this uh, this evening um, but along with the other speakers um, again really concerned with the state of our NHS the impact that this is having on our patients our families and particularly those staff who within our region are striving so hard to deliver outstanding care in the most challenging of circumstances but I'd like to particularly address the issue of social care and my disappointment um, to hear that the government um, their green paper on care has been kicked back into the long grass until at least the autumn. Um, and this disappoints me as social care is not only an important partner to the NHS, but it's also a service of crucial importance in its own right. But I'm not surprised that um, Hunt and May seem to be afraid of tackling the problems within the care sector. I think um, Theresa May 
um, what happened when she um, announced the dementia attacks just before the general election um, last year, probably um, it served as a, no a notice. But her announcement um, of some kind of Brexit money spree um, th this month as well, uh, you know, it, it doesn't fool us, those who work in the NHS or those who, who depend on the NHS. But the situation in social care is critical and we're seeing that this is leaving many elderly and vulnerable people unable to access the care that they need and on top of this, leaving far too many employees within the care sector susceptible to abuse and exploitation when non-payment of the minimum wage remains depressingly widespread across the country. And Andrew Lansley tried to rid the Secretary of State for Health of Responsibility for Head, for Health, sorry, and Hunt, can, Hunt cannot Hunt cannot be allowed to rid himself of the responsibility he has towards health and social care. After all, the situation that we find ourselves in is one of political choice. choice. I'm pleased that 35 councils have signed up to Unison's Ethical Care Charter and that many more like ours are in conversations on how we could take that charter forward. But it's no con con coincidence that the overwhelming majority of these councils are Labour councils. And Unison also have a residential care charter which sets out minimum standards and employment conditions required to deliver decent care. And it's well evident that employment level, pay, conditions and training are directly related to the quality of care that's given. And yes, I'm sure that we all agree health and social care needs to be adequately funded, but that funding needs to find its way to providing actual care and not into companies such as Carillion and Southern Cross. This is a sector that employs some 1.5 million people and contributes approximately 46 billion to the economy. But to many, the decision made by the government to delay the green paper has been seen as a lack of commitment to invest, support and strengthen the social care sector and address the needs of vulnerable adult carers, families within our communities. So as we celebrate the 70th birthday of the NHS and coincidentally, my 20 years service to the NHS too, I'm afraid the case will take a little bit of heat. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hobson. Councillor Ashby. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, as I may have mentioned previously, I, I have a daughter and two granddaughters alive and healthy today thanks to the Special Care Baby Unit a world-class facility at the RBI here in Newcastle. Like very many others, I have cause to be very grateful to the staff within the NHS. But that must not blind us to the institution itself, the fifth largest employer in the world. I was born before the NHS was created, one of only a small proportion of people in the council chamber in that position. And it's about attitudes to old people that I want to speak of now. It's been reported by Age UK that cancer treatment drops off dramatically after the age of 75, but yet a third of all cancers are diagnosed after that age. The Royal College of Surgeons says that the rate, rates of elective surgery for a range of common conditions are considerably lower for the over 65s. The Centre for Policy on Ageing says there's under investigation and under treatment of the elderly in cancer care, cardiology and strokes. And all of this in a context whose latest manifestation is the Gosport War Memorial Hospital, where over 11 years as many as 650 elderly patients were given high-strength opioids without clinical need, seemingly shortening many lives. Two years ago, my brother and I watched over our mother dying over the course of a week. But when we weren't there, we had causes of concern about the way she was treated and how her wartime attitude of not wanting to be a bother was accepted at face value to her detriment. There is something seriously wrong about the way many of our most vulnerable citizens end their days. The patient management system in Newcastle is, I'm told by experts, among the best there is. But this motion is not just talking about Newcastle. So while I support the amendment and the spirit of the motion, we must not deceive ourselves and the public by continually eulogising the institution of the NHS and calling for ever more funds without checking results and outcomes. After 70 years, it needs to look at itself and ask, can we do better, especially for older people? And it must. As Psalm 71 says, do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent.
Thank you, Councillor Ashby. Um, Councillor Mendelssohn. I'd like to speak uh, in support of Councillor Kangawa's motion. On the Health Scrutiny Committee, we see at every meeting the impact of the reduction in funding both to NHS and social care, but also we hear about the innovative work which is developing between, for example, Newcastle Hospitals Trust and our social care section and with other partners and the potential to do such a lot more if these services were all adequately resourced. The reablement service delivered by social care staff is just one example of what has already been achieved and could be further developed. Integration can only be truly effective when all the services, social care, public health, prevention, primary and urgent care and mental health, are properly funded and staffed by people who receive a decent wage for the job they do and who receive adequate training and support. The impact on our communities of the closure of GP practices in our most deprived areas has been noted and there is clear evidence that waiting lists and lack of adequate provision resulting from a woefully inadequately funded mental health service not only impact on all our residents but also has a knock-on effect on the effectiveness of other services such as the City Council's youth offending team and children's social care and on the educational attainment of young people. These are vital services and mental health plays a key role in those. The staff delivering to, to the, these services to the very best possible standard they can amid such difficulties deserve our highest respect and we owe it to them and all Newcastle residents to do whatever we can to secure funding required. Please support the motion. Councillor Hudder, do you reserve the right to speak on the amendment? Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'll try not to repeat most of the stuff that's already been said, um, but would like to take a bit of a historical perspective. When the NHS was formed, you may remember it was formed after the Beveridge Report, who was a Liberal peer. Um, and the NHS was a very different, in its, its administration, its physical structure, and the objectives which guided clinical practice at the time. We should also recall that the big problem they faced was about communicable diseases like TB and diphtheria that were responsible for thousands of deaths and disabilities. Things like infant mortality rates were high and inpatient hospital stays were long, even a fairly simple operation like appendicitis. You were in bed for two weeks. After. Now you'd be lucky if you were in for two days. Um, and for some disorders, we actually had no treatments at all. And there was at the time 120 psychiatric hospitals where if you went in, you almost never came out. They just grew and grew and grew. And in our own area, St. Nick's had 1,200 patients. Some had 3,000. Um, but it did spur, over the next decade, a massive rise in the development of medications and treatments, because for some of these people, we had very little, um, and particularly the growth of specialised antibiotics um, to treat infections and inflammations and psychiatric hospitals. And I actually have met nurses who worked in diphtheria wards who said, after vaccinations came in, they were emptied and they had to turn around and say, where are all the children? And they had to change those wards for something else because the diphtheria went down massively. Um, and gradually over the years, the focus has changed from treatment to prevention. But I do remember my own grandmother and family who got glasses on the NHS and got false teeth and thought that was terrific. Um, and as we've moved on to more preventive measures, um, because of the advances in treatment, we can deal with conditions such as leukemias and uh, multiple sclerosis and meningitis, which were formerly all killers. And now we look at diseases of lifestyle, 
diabetes type 2, obesity, stress, eating disorders, and things like strokes and heart disease, which people just did not survive. And lots of complex issues like genetic disorders. Um, all of these are expensive, they require highly trained staff, and the NHS has never been able to supply all of its own stuff, and we've relied on recruitment from the former Commonwealth countries and latterly the EU. And social care, as has been mentioned already, now takes something like 38 to 40 percent of all council budgets. Um, and if we believe Theresa May that they're going to invest 20 million pound into the NHS, if that happens, it will be very welcome. But it still doesn't address the shortfall for the increasing numbers of people requiring social care. Um, I do Thank hope you. that members will welcome this amendment as it adds a valuable focus by looking at prevention and education. So I'd ask you to please address this friendly amendment and support it. Thank you. Councillor McCarty, you reserve the right to reply. Thank you very sorry, much. Sorry, just second it, sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor. Um, I do want to say happy birthday, NHS. I'm glad we are united across the Council Chamber um, in that view. Um, and the, just for information, the Labour Party will be celebrating with, uh, I have got a massive birthday card at home that we will be um, celebrating in the city centre um, on the uh, 7th of July, and we will almost certainly have cake so that we have a proper birthday party. Lord Mayor, I think we are really, really lucky in this city. Um, some of our colleagues across the Council Chamber are uh, heavily involved in the NHS this, uh, as we speak, and Councillor Hoddart and Councillor Talbot and Councillor Young are struggling with injuries. Um, it, it reminds us that we will all have personal um, stories about our friends, family, acquaintances, colleagues, uh, and how excellent our services are in this city. We've got a fantastic record on research, forward thinking, the Centre for Ageing, that's the work in the university, and the investment in life sciences is all fantastic. Really excellent and forward thinking. We've got excellent hospital facilities um, and, and really good uh, local health services. And Lord Mayor, I do think today is the right place to record our thanks to all of the hardworking staff, not our two colleagues in the room who have spoken, but indeed the hundreds uh, of thousands who work in the NHS and support people um, across the country. But we all know about the longer queues. Um, we all know about the um, difficulties that uh, residents have in getting an appointment. Um, and we are, I think we are genuinely all concerned about this across the council chamber. Um, can I just turn briefly to the amendment, Lord Mayor? Councillor Hall talked about uh, what this council could do in terms of campaigning. Um, he highlighted a couple of um, potential campaign days. Actually, this council goes much, much further than celebrating one-off events. We have a huge commitment to health that, and meeting the health needs and the well-being, the wider health needs, really, of our staff. Um, one example of that, Councillor McGuinness and I yesterday were at a sexual health event, uh, not just with um, formal sexual health services, but with partners who support um, health and well-being around sexual health and we will work towards being a sexually healthy city. Um, the amendment that Councillor Hall has brought us tonight all depends on a fair funding settlement, and sadly, um, on this side of the council chamber, we don't trust the government would give us that. And to be fair, I have just looked up the uh, Office of Budget Responsibility figures, because I was almost certain I had the facts right. In the last 60 years, the lowest growth was under the coalition, I don't think the party opposite have got anything to talk to us about in terms of investment in health. Um, so I'm really proud, Lord Mayor, of what the Labour government did between 1997 and 2010. Um, our reliance on workers from abroad is um, a real concern. I think colleagues have mentioned that. So the government have promised significant resources, uh, and today we don't actually know where those resources are coming from. I, I think Councillor Hobson's right, it's a magic money forest. Um, so we'll, we'll wait and see. But the real issue, which is not addressed by the government, 
uh, or by the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, which I think is really interesting, Lord Mayor, because I've not really heard very much at all from the Secretary of State about social care. Um, our real issue, uh, as some colleagues have mentioned, is the lack of funding for adult social care. And until that issue is addressed, you know, kicking the uh, green paper off into the future is of huge concern. Um, so until that issue is addressed, we cannot trust this government. Um, our motion, Lord Mayor, gives us the opportunity to celebrate uh, the se fantastic 70 years and uh, asks the government to make sure that our funding is adequate so that we can protect those of us who need our support. Thank you very much. Councillor Kirogor, you have the right to reply. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you to colleagues across the chamber who have spoken so eloquently tonight. Councillor Taylor made some extremely relevant points about vacant posts, staff retention and the potentially detrimental effect of Brexit across the NHS, um, and I would add social care to that. Councillor Hobson is right to highlight the lack of a, co of a coherent funding strategy across health and social care, as well as the need for good paying conditions for workers across the health service and, and social care, and is right to highlight the need for additional funding to, to go back into actual care provision and health provision. Um, and can I congratulate Councillor Hobson on her 20 years service? Um, Councillor Mendelssohn rightly raised the importance of mental health um, services. Um, and the impact that good mental health services have on across the health and care system. Um, I'd like to thank Councillor Hall for his amendment and recognise it as a, as a friendly one and congratulate him on an excellent maiden speech. Um, but I think that, as Councillor McCarty has said, we would need to better understand any funding amounts and distribution formula um, for place-based budgets before we could call on the government to move towards them, as well as understand any future um, tranches of devolution and where such budgets may fit. Um, there's another anniversary we could perhaps mention tonight. It was actually eight years ago, on the 22nd of June last week, that the coalition government announced its summer budget, cuts in corporation tax rates alongside massive cuts in public spending. I read a report earlier this week that suggested that the total cost of the, these and subse subsequent corporate giveaways will be around £110 billion by 2022. £110 billion at a time when the public sector and the NHS and adult social care in particular are facing a funding crisis. Austerity is a political choice and one I hope we can reverse at the ballot box in the very near future. Move the motion, Lord Mayor. Okay, it would appear that we would need to <coughs> vote on the amendment then, if it's not accepted. Um. Can we sell the bell? Oh, not yet. Any moment, no. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, okay. So the amendment is lost, 50 votes to 16, was it? Right. So we'll now we'll go to the notice of motion. Okay, all agreed? Thank you. Item number 11, the Notice of Motion Discovery sco School. I call upon Councillor Casey to move the motion and seconded by Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Chair. The imminent closure of the Discovery School following its deeply troubling Ofsted report has presented Newcastle and, and neighbouring local authorities with a challenge. How do we find appropriate places for Discovery School pupils in time for uh, September, especially for those who are already partway through their GCSE years? This is just one example of how the separation of the free schools program from the local authorities' place planning responsibility puts children at risk of losing out on education. Given that the free schools program is practically the only way to establish a new school, it is also very concerning that local authorities which identify a need for a new school have to wait until a wave of free schools is announced and then hope to be successful in bidding, 
rather than being able to plan on our own timescales. It is very frustrating that the government has con continued to insist that the free schools program is the only way to establish a new school, in spite of the very high costs associated with the program at a time of uh, cuts to local authority schools' budgets and increased pressures on schools. Children in local authority and former local authority schools continue in many cases to go to class in outdated, sometimes drafty and leaking classrooms, while the government invests millions in building new free schools, estimated to reach 10 billion by 2021, according to the Education Policy Institute, in contrast to the estimated 7 billion it would cost to bring every existing school up to satisfactory condition. In the program to date, free schools have not always served their local communities, as evidenced by the fact that free schools established in areas of high deprivation have fewer children entitled to free school meals on average than their surrounding populations would su uh, suggest. While I welcome recent changes to the program, which indicate a desire to work more closely with local authorities and communities and to reflect local need more consistently, I still believe that legislation is needed to put the involvement of local authorities in, in all schools in their area on a, on a statutory footing where it cannot be affected by the whim of those in central government. Education has seen far too many swings in policy over the last number of years, and there is sadly little sign that this instability is at an end. The report Free for All, published by the National Foundation for Educational Research last month, noted that very few free schools have been genuinely innovative, or have had par more parent involvement than other schools, which suggests that in many cases, the same outcomes could have been achieved more cheaply by funding and enabling local authorities to establish local schools. I am proud of how our staff have stepped up to the challenge presented by the closure of Discovery School, as well as how local schools have offered places to many of the children who have been attending Discovery School, and additional places continue to be found. However, I believe that if the local authority had been empowered to act preemptively, we would have dealt with the underlying issues in a manner less disruptive to children's education. I therefore call on the government to restore power and sufficient funding to local authorities, which would be appropriate to our statutory role in school place planning. Unfortunately, I cannot support the amendment to this motion, as it focuses on how we deal with future abrupt school closures, rather than on how we avoid such an occasion ever occurring, which is the only way to guarantee educational continuity for children and to ensure that precious funds and time are not wasted in setting up schools to fail. It also ignores the need for the council to be adequately funded in order to take an active role in school place planning. I call on council to support the original motion. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Forbes. I second the motion and reserve the right to speak. Thank you. I now call on Councillor Cott to move an amendment seconded by Councillor Stone. Okay, thank you very much, Lord Mayor, and thank you very much uh, to Councillor Casey for bringing this motion, which is obviously really important. I think she's slightly misunderstood the tenor of uh, the amendment, which I would like to think is quite a friendly amendment. Um, however, let's start with some uh, things which I think we're uh, united upon. Um, I think this is a, an extremely troublesome case. It's very troubling to think that a school that opened in 2014 uh, at the cost of £9 million pounds, um, is, is actually going to be closing, um, and the disruption that's caused around that for uh, the transfer of pupils in the system um, and the knock-on effect that that will have on other schools. We, have, we talked a little bit about that in the previous report that was put to council. So um, this is all very troubling. It's troubling as well in the Ofsted report that there were all sorts of issues that have been raised around curriculum, around safeguarding arrangements, around the uptake of school places. Um, and I think uh, this all points to the problems when you introduce a uh, school system which has a lack of proper local accountability. So I think these are all really salient points to mention. Um, in terms of our amendment, um, we've actually put forward one or two points which I think uh, complement um, and in indeed extend the, uh, uh, the intentions of this local council in terms of what we might be able to do. Um, it uh, strengthens the uh, importance of actually finding solutions for uh, the pupils who are going to be affected by this. Um, it actually makes very, very clear 
um, that we need to, um, uh, to, to uh, have proper oversight. I think uh, Councillor Casey suggested that, uh, that the amendment was trying to dilute some of that. Not at all. It's the exact opposite. It's reinforcing the importance of local uh, oversight here. And in fact, uh, Liberal Democrat policy is actually to devolve all capital monies for new school places to local authorities so that we can actually deal with these issues. Because one of the issues for me, which I think is so inequitable about this system, which I feel very strongly about, is that... Um, what it does is it creates inequalities, inequality of access to school places. It puts potentially schools in areas which don't need places when there are shortages in other places. I could get very angry about this because this isn't in anyone's interest at all. Um, and I know that what, someone's going to come back and say, well, there's the Education Act of 2011 and Liberal Democrats are involved in the coalition. I was actually at that time serving on a ministerial advisory group. And it was, it was uh, it, well, I have to tell you, it was, a, it was a very interesting situation to be part of a junior... <laughs> Uh, coalition party who wasn't able to be listened to on these particular issues. Interestingly, however, that many of those who are in favour of free schools and academies actually were, uh, thought that the Liberal Democrats were a thorn in the government's side, and one of them actually uh, told me this in a, one occasion I was in a lift going up to the meeting, so if it wasn't for these pesky Liberal Democrats, we'd be in a much better position. Um, and I said, well, I'm one of those pesky Liberal Democrats. So I think we were able to do a number of other things um, which were important to us around um, our, 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 uh, our educational agenda. But unfortunately, this particular one was not something we were in favour of. And uh, subsequently, we uh, have in our manifesto, our 2017 manifesto, um, we have corrected that particular position. And I think you'll find there's a lot of um, common uh, cause now between the two parties represented in this chamber. But I do think one of the things that we do find here, and it comes up over and over again, we do have a culture in this authority where everything is blamed on the government, right? Okay, the government has created a problem, but there are levers that the, the council has, it has expertise, it has, um, it has uh, capacity to be able to make things better. And I don't want anyone to go away from this chamber thinking that there is nothing that the local authority can do. And that is why we have made very clear that it's important that local authority um, both helps the pupils who need our help, and I accept that the, the local authority is trying to do that, but it would be nice to hear about how that's happening. I haven't heard any thing about that. And I did put some questions to council about that, but they were deemed to be not ones that should be coming to this meeting. Anyway, that's another story, but I was slightly irritated about that, um, because I think that was really important. But anyway, I think, I think we are actually in unity in terms of the basic principles. But this takes us a little further. The amendment takes us a little further. It puts the pressure on us to actually do what we can with the resources that we have available. We have limited capacity, but we can actually do things to help uh, our uh, pupils um, who are affected by this and to support our schools generally across the city. And there is a danger, finally, there is a danger in conflating two different things. One is the issue of the immediate closure of the school. The second issue is the principle about, uh, about free schools. I think if you put them together and try and muddy the waters, it actually creates a very uncertain and unsatisfactory position. Let's be honest about what we can achieve locally and campaign where we have uh, unanimity together to actually resist uh, pressure from government and to and put pressure on government to change its policy and amend the uh, Education Act of 2011 so that local authorities do have greater capacity to support schools in school place planning. It's really important and let's work together to achieve it. Thank you. Councillor Stone. I second the amendment and reserve the right to speak. Thank you. Can I call on Councillor Dunn to, to speak to this motion? Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm supporting Councillor Casey's motion unamended. Personally, I don't think that there's anything friendly about an amendment that accepts the possibility of the continuation of free schools. Council, we should have a nation of good local schools that are part of a national comprehensive education system and which are accountable to local communities. It's only by providing sufficient resources to a national education service that we'll get a world-class education system 
that delivers for the many and not the few. In these tough times, who's laughing? Well, stop it. In these tough times, the need to ensure our young people receive the education they need and deserve has never been greater. The failure of the Discovery School is an unmitigated tragedy for the pupils, parents and staff. And this is despite government pledges that schools will be protected from cuts and demonstrates the total failure of government policy. Local authorities have long been the glue that holds society together. Services that every person uses at some point or all of their lives. Essential services, including providing education for the young or not so young. We know all too well the damage that's being done to our services and to the future sustainability of local government. While central government is banking the surplus on the main non-domestic rate account in England by up to £10 billion by 2019 20 This is truly disgusting and we need to argue that the first call on those surpluses should be to meet our financial pressures, including within education. And as Councillor Kilgour said, ten times that figure, 110 billion, will have been given away in corporate handouts by 2022. While our children are starved of cash, teachers are begging parents for money, and other services are in crisis. There's no evidence, Council, that overall academies, free schools, and multi-academy trusts are any better than equivalent maintained schools. Council, I think we should welcome the Labour Party proposals for a national education service in England to give equal opportunity in education, free point of use. Labour would not waste money on free schools, would introduce a fairer funding formula and would scrap the Tories' nonsensical plans to force schools to pay the apprenticeship levy. Make no mistake, Council, we, on this side of the Chamber, will always do our best to stand by our young people and their parents. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor. In, uh, it, it quite clearly says in our amendment that we would wish seek to see the Education Act of 2011 uh, amended to remove the presumption that any new school will be a free school, school or academy. It's being presented that our motion is basically saying that uh, we uh, are in favour of um, the continuing with the current system. Right? That is not what it says. So that's what I wanted to clarify, Lord Mayor, and I hope that members opposite will actually reflect that in their speeches. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to speak in favour of Councillor Casey's motion. Uh, in my career, I've read a great many Ofsted reports, and I can quite honestly categorically state that the report of the Discovery School is the most disturbing I've ever read. It was, in fact, the school's second inadequate report in its poor four years. For an inadequate report, I'd expect it to mention poor teaching, lack of student progress, and, and tutors' low expectation of pupils. But when it states, and I quote, a hard core of pupils display riotous behavior as they roam the school in a predatory manner and that some pupils don't recognize the difference between right and wrong, and that they have no respect for others' faiths, cultures, or tolerance of people they regard as different, you have to be really alarmed. You have to question the leadership and management of the school, but you also have to question and ask why this school, with its unresearched vision, its very narrow curriculum, that evidently wasn't meeting the needs of its pupil or the community was allowed to open. The Tory government needs to stop this flawed government policy and allow local authorities to plan and build schools where communities need them. And they also need to be able to support them so that the quality of provision is scrutinized. 
228 students have had four years of a terrible, terrible education in a very unsafe environment, which is an absolute scandal. Thank you to the staff in Newcastle who actually went out and did offer support and some local schools. And thank you to council officers for actually getting those, new, those students a new place. It's something, though, that should never, ever have happened. I urge Councillor Casey to make it clear in her correspondence with the Secretary of State for Education these concerns, and I support her motion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ashby. Hello, Mayor. Um, I, I join in the feelings of outrage that the Discovery School has closed at such short notice and that so many children and their parents have been thrust into limbo. I also congratulate and thank council officers on their efforts to find places in Newcastle schools for Newcastle residents and reflect on the impact on our planning processes of this sudden reduction in capacity. Perhaps we should note that if all three schools are swept away, as seems to be being suggested opposite, council will have these problems to a huge multiple. It's also worth reminding ourselves of the good educational intentions with which this project started and urge an examination to ensure if there are any lessons which we can learn. The Discovery School was set up to focus especially on science, technology, engineering and math subjects at GCSE and A-level. Its failure should not detract from the value of these subjects, particularly those uh, for whom a broader curriculum and art subjects are inappropriate. Although much of this is out with the control of Newcastle City Council, we should be constantly aware that one size doesn't always fit all. I support the amendment. Thank you. Councillor Avery. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I think it's slightly puzzling to me that the Lib Dems, or at least Councillor Cott, seems to be happy with the role of Scooby-Doo uh, as the meddlesome kids. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think they've even reached those heights and have more uh, perhaps a shaggy or a scrappy-doo. And I would suggest, perhaps, that if there's going to be a coalition in the future, they might bear this lesson in in, uh, in uh, mind that if you're not being listened to, the sensible thing is not to continue to be a part of that coalition. And importantly, we did see that Lib Dems sometimes did just say no, as they did over the boundary review, and that policy had to be withdrawn. So what really happened is not that Lib Dems were not listened to, but they made a Faustian pact to get certain things that they wanted in return for incredibly damaging changes such as free schools. And while at the same time knowing that these were damaging, um, and he, he, bears, he brings reference to the fact that the uh, manifestos are very similar now, they were very similar before the formation of the coalition. It's just, it turns out that a lot of members of his own party didn't really care about large parts of that manifesto, or were in fact much more in agreement with members of the co uh, Conservative Party. And uh, it, it, it is, it is sort of weird to say, uh, as some members have done opposite, that we need to bear in mind the good intentions that this was begun with. Because as we all know from scripture and, and from Dante, that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. People very rarely, uh, though members of the Conservative Party test this, very rarely start off with ill intentions. The problem is that it's not good enough to just have good intentions. And when with free schools there was no attempt at all to make any kind of planning uh, moving from a system, and I didn't like academies either, where you had the vast majority of schools controlled by local education authorities to a situation where almost none were controlled by local education authorities with no attempt to create a framework, no attempt to put in systems of accountability, no attempt to deal with the very real possibility of collapse, which is inherent in the market that conservatives wanted to establish in education. Markets have failures, businesses go bust. There was no attempt made to plan for this, uh, and, and this is the inevitable outcome. And I, I would also note that even where they see success, I see failure because free schools were given ruinous, uh, ruinous freedom when it came to selection criteria and admission criteria. The entire, uh, the entire scheme was flawed from the start. One of the best achieving free schools is, I'm, I'm sorry to say, a Jewish school, the Jewish free school, but it also has the un, unwanted distinction of being the least deprived school in the entire country, even including Eton. It is significantly less diverse than Eton College, 
because it only admits Jewish peoples and it has a restrictive definition of what it means by Jewish. So there are zero peoples in the entire school who are on free school meals. It is an entirely segregated school where people have no contact with people from different backgrounds, no contact with people from different social classes. And that is the sort of freedom that was established by free schools. And it is not a freedom that I want any part of. And it's a tremendous shame to me that uh, communal leaders within my community chose to do that. The entire system was deeply flawed from the beginning, and members opposite need to recognize that. And as um, my ward colleague, Councillor Casey, said, um, we, we absolutely cannot accept the changes that the amendment makes on funding. We think it's incredibly important that we remove this whole ruinous system uh, and have a real decent system of funding and not what members opposite always seem to talk about, which is people locally paying for things locally. We need a real, proper, fair system, not devolving responsibility and devolving blame Thank you very uh, much. without funding. Thank you, Councillor Overly. <laughs> Councillor Greenhoff. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And obviously, I um, support the motion brought forward by my colleague, Councillor Casey, and I don't support the motion brought forward by the Lib Dems. Um, what we're seeing with the Discovery School and elsewhere in the country is the impact what an ideological experiment with children's futures has had on children. We have children who are currently in year 10, halfway through their GCSEs, who are going to have to be re-schooled elsewhere, going to have to start again at a complete new school, who may not even have the courses they're currently doing on offer where they need to move to, to the new schools and it's going to ruin their life opportunities going forward and for the sake of an ideological experiment which was supported by the Lib Dems. I wasn't here in 2016 but I, uh, I wasn't here before 2016 but perhaps Councillor Cott who's shaking his head can show me the motion that the Lib Dem brought at the time saying what an awful scheme this was and how Newcastle would unite to make sure that there was no free schools in Newcastle and if he wishes to bring me that motion I'd, I'll take that back if, if you did bring one at the time but I don't remember there being one. Greg, thank you as always for your chuntering. Um, <laughs> what we see, as I said, it's an ideological experiment that's ruining kids' lives up and down the country. We have no control as a council, or limited control, over what happens in these schools, but yet it's the council, when things go wrong, has to step in and try and pick up the pieces. It's the council who had to send officers into that school to try and help, and frankly now, it's the parents who are turning to the council, to councillors, to local members of parliament, and saying, can you help? And at the end of the day, if we have so limited resources on what we can do to help, and it's entirely at the fault of the coalition government, supported by the Liberal Democrats and by the party opposite. So, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Councillor Stone, you reserve the right to speak. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I shall turn to run a bit more for Councillor Greenoff's benefits. Um, in seconding Councillor Cott's sensible amendment, I should like to make a few points in respect to the Discovery School issue and some related schools policy issues. I want to say first it is very important that we acknowledge this is a, a, a real blow to the children and families who went to Discovery, the Discovery School. Uh, it is them that we, we, should be, we should be concerned about first and foremost rather than making knock about political points. Uh, it is clearly regrettable that the Discovery School has failed. In the circumstances though I can see why closure has been the right and probably the only decision that could be, could be reached. I used to live uh, a few hundred yards from the school. I was very impressed with the new facility when it was built. I thought it was a good thing to have a science and technology focused school close to the Science Central site. I particularly thought it was worthwhile for West End families to have access to a choice of good schools in their areas, given uh, an increasing population and a lack of alternative secondary provision apart from that at Excelsior Academy. Uh, it is clearly highly unfortunate that aspiration with good intent to provide greater educational opportunities has gone so badly wrong in practice and in its management and leadership. The second point is the closure has a knock-on effect on other schools in the city uh, in that schools already of a significant size will have to seek to accommodate those who have been displaced at short notice, and that inevitably puts a greater strain on resources and on class sizes. There is a very important point that there isn't likely to be a need for additional secondary school capacity in the city in coming years, and as yet, no clear route as to how that will be funded and delivered. We should also acknowledge that there have been a few bumps in the road in recent years in respect of our own local secondaries. The third point I would make is about the Council's role and capacity to influence planning of school provision and as well as educational outcomes in the city, given the change in the, in the policy context and school governance. Given the corporate structure of the council, the director of people has a huge area of responsibility. 
and I saw it as a very welcome step um, a year or so, a, a few years ago, when, when the council took steps to introduce an assistant director of education into the structure to augment capacity, given an acknowledged shortfall of senior management um, um, uh, time and resource um, in, in that directorate. And I was very impressed with the work, and I commend the work that Dean Jackson uh, did for the council. I very much regret that he has now left, and I would like to seek some assurances from the administration that his departure will not lead to a renewed shortage of senior management capacity. Finally, I would hope there's a degree of consensus that there is an important role for local accountability in the education system that has been eroded by the governments, by both the, the coalition government and also by the previous Labour government. Let us acknowledge that here and now. The move to academies was an ideological experiment. It was something that was actively and strongly forced upon uh, this council and, and on, on, on Councillor Cotton's administration when we, we tried our best to, to argue against that. We were told that there was no other option that was going to be imposed upon us. And uh, I think it is a bit rich, really, for, for um, some of the points made, about, uh, uh, made earlier on about, about forcing ideological experiments on, on, on people it needs to be viewed in that context and that history, particularly in the West End of Newcastle. Um, I've tended to the view myself that diversity and innovation and provision in principle is a good thing, but I think the insistence that only on academies and free schools has been unduly restrictive and has come at significant cost to local accountability and transparent oversight. In future, if it's possible, that may change. The North of Teal Tyne deal inclusion of an educational challenge strand, as has proved highly successful in London, would appear to suggest there may still be a role for local and regional leadership on education, and I have no hesitation in supporting that part of the deal. Councillor Casey's motion and Councillor Cott's amendment referred to local oversight and local devolution of, of education and capital investment. I hope there's common ground on that. But I will make one last concern. I know the Labour's manifesto commitment to a national education service. I know the party opposite likes the, the idea of nationalising things. What will this mean in practice? Will this mean uh, nationally appointed NES commis commissars uh, appointed to run education in adherence with a top-down state control philosophy of education. I don't think that's very localist either, frankly. Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, it's uh, interesting to note that Councillor Stone is wearing his I am six badge tonight. And uh, if he had read his constitutional committee papers, as will become apparent later on this evening, uh, he will also know that we have just agreed to move with the appointment process for Dean Jackson's successor to ensure that we have the right capacity in place in this authority to support schools right across this city. And Councillor Holland has very eloquently led, read out sections of the absolutely damning and devastating Ofsted report into the Discovery School. It is quite frankly a disgrace that any school, let alone a school in this city, should have ended up with an Ofsted report like it. And serious questions must be asked of the government, of the management and leadership of the school, and of the regional schools commissioner as to what they knew and when. Because I can tell you, this authority did not know that there were problems in the school. This authority did not have any route into communications with the school. And that's one of the fundamental challenges with the whole free school experimental program, that they're able to operate entirely isolated from the rest of the school community in the city. And that is the fundamental problem, Lord Mayor, that I took to the schools minister back in 2011, because then I was vice chair of the LGA's Children and Young People board. And I went as a part of a delegation with the Conservative chair of that board to speak to the schools minister about the concerns that we had around the proposed free school policy. We were concerned that free schools would be set up without reference to the schools in their area. We were concerned that the local authorities in those areas would have no say over the location of those schools, which made a mockery of the responsibility of councils around school place planning. We were concerned that the direction of capital funding to free schools at the exclusion of other existing schools which were seriously in need of improvement. That schools minister was David Laws, the Liberal Democrat schools minister. He listened to our concerns and did not act upon them. And I have to say to Council, I am very fond of Councillor Cott. He and I have much in common and as I pointed out at Cabinet the other day, he and I are Council twins. But, Councillor Cott, do you not recall that you were on the National Advisory Panel that advised David Laws, the Schools Minister, about his education policy during the Coalition Government years? Don't you remember that? Don't you remember standing up in this Council Chamber and telling us in this room how important it was that we moved ahead with academies and free schools? No, you've forgotten that part of your party's history because you're trying to paper over the cracks. 
and Lord Mayor, cracks have appeared in this policy and children have fallen through them. And the reason I'm opposing this amendment tonight, Lord Mayor, is not just because it allows us to continue, it commits to the continuation of free schools earlier in the text, but because significantly on the capital budget issue, this calls for the devolution of existing budgets. I don't have a problem with the devolution of existing budgets, but our original motion calls for adequate capital budgets for schools in this city. And that is a far greater funding requirement from government than the amendment commits to. We know that the many schools in this city, particularly primary schools, are desperately in need of refurbishment and being rebuilt. And yet the money has been grabbed by the free schools programme and those schools have been starved of that investment. That has been the wrong decision for the last six, seven, eight years, Lord Mayor, and I hope that we can very soon get a government which will reverse this dreadful decision and ensure that no further children end up in the dreadful situation that they have here in Newcastle in recent weeks. Councillor Casey. Thank you, Chair. I uh, welcome colleagues' comments, and particularly Councillor Forbes' enlightening personal view on the history of the free schools programme. I can only echo Councillor Avery's remark that colleagues on the other side of the floor, if, you're, if you were in coalition and not being listened to on important issues, unfortunately you should not be in coalition, and you may have been unwise in your choice to go into government with the Tories. The school could not have been closed unilaterally if it had not been a free school, so the two issues are intimately related. Councillor Dunn makes excellent points regarding the needs for a fairer funding formula, and Councillor Holland may, uh, likewise makes good points about the need for improved oversight of free schools in order to avoid Newcastle's reputation being tarred with an Ofsted report, which comes, even comes close to the, to the Discovery School in future. Councillor Ashby is incorrect in assuming that we would sweep away all existing free schools. We, would, and we want to support local schools, whatever their origin, and to learn from good practice wherever it is found. Sadly, that was not the case in the Discovery School. As noted by Councillor Kilgour when speaking on the NHS, austerity is a political choice. The 11 billion tax break for the most wealthy has cost us, among other things, 20,000 teachers every year for five years. The government could choose to fund local schools to a sufficient level, but it continues to make other choices while weeping qu crocodile tears about the poor state of education. Austerity was also a policy under the former coalition government in which the Liberal Democrat Party played an active role. Councillor Greenhalgh is absolutely right that it's shameful that many children transferring from Discovery will have their exam preparation disrupted, which is uh, an interesting comment on certain other issues within our education system. But uh, as we're... <laughs> trying to get through many things in this in this tonight's meeting I, I'll leave that for another time I call on council to support the motion thank you before I go on to ask um, you to vote can I just say that whilst we may disagree with what another councillor may say in the chamber we all need to show restraint and allow the colleague to do so what they feel they have to say without ridicule or sarcasm I will allow clarification when needed. At the, the weekend, I attended a great get-together at the Bar Academy on Benwell Lane. Um, one of the things that uh, the late Joe Cox w wanted and lived for was an end of dis divisive politics. And I think what we need to do is check our purpose of speaking. If we want to inform, encourage, and unite uh, in the purposes of this City Council, fine. If we want to divide, ridicule, or not tell the truth, then we need to change. Right, can I ask uh, for a vote on the amendment, please? That is lost 48, uh, the amendment is lost 50 to 15. And so now vote on the original motion.
Okay, th that is agreed. Thank you. Item number 12 is the notice of motion on the Srebrenica genocide. I will call on Councillor Chartwell to move the motion, seconded by Councillor Schofield. Thank you, Lord Mayor. This is a timely and crucial motion prompted by the upcoming 23rd anniversary of the Srebrenica genocide in Bosnia-Herzegovina on the 11th of July. The motion also commends and pays tribute to the Bosnian community in Newcastle, many of whom in the gallery upstairs tonight. The motion aims to reflect their voices and acknowledge their contribution to this city. Described by the UN as the greatest atrocity in Europe since the Second World War, 8,372 Bosnian Muslim boys and men were killed by Serbian nationalist forces at Srebrenica as part of a wider ethnic cleansing campaign characterized by mass rape of young girls and women. Estimates range from 20,000 to 100,000. Mass murder, concentration camps, and displacement. During the Bosnian war between 1992 and 1995, more than 100,000 people were killed and two million displaced. What is so shocking is that such a previously well integrated country could be ripped open by the politics of ethnic nationalism. This was a genocide that took place within all of our lifetimes and in the continent that exclaimed never again. The motion imp is important now as we face new challenges across Europe, including the rise of right-wing political parties and hate crime. Whilst for Bosnians, the last two decades have been characterized by genocide denial, historical revisionism, and the absence of justice for victims and survivors. So in summary, the motion has three main themes. Remembrance, to remember the victims and survivors of the Srebrenica genocide whilst challenging hatred and helping to strengthen our communities in Newcastle. Learning, to learn lessons from Srebrenica, demonstrating how hatred and intolerance can flourish if left unchallenged in our communities. And justice, to fight for justice for the victims and survivors, acknowledging that there are nearly, uh, nearly 10,000 missing people in Bosnia today. It's also important to note that similar atrocities towards Muslims happened all over Bosnia, following a similar pattern of rape, prison camps, and ethnic cleansing. Indeed, today is the 26th anniversary of the massacre at Visegrad, where 3,000 boys and men were murdered. Whilst in the town of Predor, Muslims and non-Serbs were forced to wear white armbands and to mark their houses. Newcastle welcomed refugees during the Bosnian war and it's vital that we continue to support the Bosnian community in the city as they continue to recover, rebuild, and integrate. The Bosnian community are especially grateful to the local MP at the time, Jim Cousins, who helped to reunite refugee families in, 1990, in 1994. Many survivors came to the city as young children and they're now proud to make a positive contribution to the local community as doctors, nurses, academics, and architects. The community is characterized by the most overwhelming interfaith and intercommunity reconciliation. It's impossible for us to imagine what it's like to lose 50 members of your family whilst the perpetrators live freely in the same communities as their victims, knowing where your loved ones are buried, but not saying. The unwavering strength of the community lies in their hope for a better future without hatred. The motion commends the Bosnian community in Newcastle in its work to oppose and tackle all forms of prejudice, hatred, racism, nationalism, and religious intolerance. We can learn so much from their experience in order to strengthen all of our communities to build a better, safer, and more cohesive society. This July commemorate, commemoration events are being organized by the British Bosnian Institute, formed by a group of Newcastle-based survivors present in the room tonight. These events will also mark the Remembering Srebrenica Charities theme for 2018, Acts of Courage. So these events include on the 10th of July, a film screening of Fog of Srebrenica with a director Q&A at Newcastle Central Library. On the 11th of July, a memorial event with speakers including Smyo Besso at the Church of the Holy Cross in West Fenham. And between the 30th of September and the 3rd of October, there's an educational trip to Bosnia with the Council of Faith in order for us all to bear witness to genocide. 
Uh, I also wanted to note that we're really grateful to the council um, for flying the Srebrenica, remembering Srebrenica flag outside the Civic Centre for the anniversary this year. So now more than ever, it's vital that communities unite together, free from hatred and division. I hope you can attend these important events. There's information about them at the desk outside um, and support this motion to council. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chartwell. And that would have been your maiden speech, I understand. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, can I call on Councillor Schofield to second the motion? And thank you very much, Lord Mayor. I am really pleased to second this motion. In the 1990s, I was involved in supporting Bosnian refugees in Oxford and was overwhelmed at times by the horror of their stories and their traumatic journeys of survival. But recently, I had the privilege of joining a delegation to the Syrian border, and I met with the mothers of Srebrenica, and they spoke movingly of their experiences in the support for women who are being used as weapons of war there. They hold a Srebrenica Memorial Day to mark the extraordinary courage of ordinary people during the genocide and the crimes against humanity. But they also very significantly make international links with what has happened elsewhere in the world, including in New York on 9-11. They aim to be a powerful reminder of the past in their fight for justice and truth and bringing to account what happened to Bosnia but everything they do aims to stop the genocide they experienced happening again and to ensure no one experiences the evil of it. This motion, which is very similar to one passed by other councils, deserves support. It is limited in its proposal and so realisable. It's compassionate and practical in the support and hope it seeks to give to Bosnian people living in Newcastle. And it expresses the principles underpinning Newcastle as a city of sanctuary giving a strong message that Newcastle Council will not tolerate hate crimes, including those against refugees, asylum seekers and migrants. Us being a city of uh, sanctuary really matters to the Bosnian people living here. The UK has a harsh refugee policy and to be a refugee these days in Britain can mean waking up to each morning to cope with anti-refugee sentiments plastered on the news, social media and on walls. And I, like others here, am really proud of how we have welcomed Bosnian refugees, among others, to our city. For those who survived the terrible massacres in Bosnia, nothing can bring back their loved ones or erase the trauma of the war when they lost everything. But acknowledging the events, remembering what happened, and providing education, health and financial services for them, as this motion proposes, can bring, begin the healing process and bring some closure to what happened to them. Please support the motion. <laughs> Councillor Ashby. Uh, Lord Mayor, uh, first of all, may I congratulate uh, Councillor Sharpwell on her maiden speech. Um, it's sobering to reflect that the breakup of a European country led to ethnic cleansing and genocide not seen in Europe since the Third Reich and its aftermath, uh, if we think that the former USSR wasn't a European nation and that the Lithuanians, for instance, that weren't ethnically cleansed when they were shipped off to the Siberian gulags in the 40s and 50s. But we should note and learn that revisionists are at work. They're already arguing about the definitions of genocide handed down by the International Criminal Court for Yugoslavia and the International Court of Justice the murders, transfers, abuse and disappearances. Then they argue about the numbers, then they argue about whether it happened at all, then shift the blame. Sounds familiar? Sounds like the arguments made about the Holocaust. Eternal vig vigilance and remembrance is essential if these horrors are not to be airbrushed from history. It's also become fashionable to blame the West for what happened and for what it failed to prevent. prevent. But Kofi Annan, Secretary General of the United Nations, in, the, in a message to the 10th anniversary commemoration of the massacre, wrote that blame lay first and foremost with those who planned and carried out the massacre and those who assisted and harboured them. Some have been convicted in the International Court, but many involved 
or complicit are still walking free. Justice must have continued to hunt them. While reflecting upon these horrors and their aftermath, we should also spare a thought for British forces deployed to former Yugoslavia on peacekeeping and humanitarian missions. These included reservists, some from Newcastle, whose experiences live with them to this day. And as today is Armed Forces Reserves Day, can we take uh, the time to thank them and all other reservists and veterans for their service. We should not ignore the, result, the rise of similar corrosive attitudes to the other and narrow nationalism in Eastern Europe. Today it was announced that Poland would scrap the law which criminalised references to Polish guilt in Nazi atrocities and was to be enforced with jail sentences. But such a law was acceptable there before the international outcry caused its reversal. The Hungarian parliament passed widely criticised anti-immigrant laws last week that made it a criminal offence punishable by a jail term to help people to lodge asylum claims. European civilization and the rule of law is under threat as much now as it was 23 or 85 years ago. Lord Mayor, I welcome and support the motion. Thank you. Councillor Avery. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And I'd like to thank um, Councillor Shabwell for bringing this and members of the community. Vala T. I'm sorry if my pronunciation is, is poor. Um, I just wanted to briefly reflect on, on what Councillor Ashby said. It actually reminded me that I met a number of years ago a gentleman who served in a British artillery uh, detachment who had been posted to, um, to Srebrenica, well, the vicinity of Srebrenica, shortly before the massacre. And uh, I, I would advise any member who has not read the Dutch government's report on the failures there to go and read it, but the failures were not limited to the Dutch government. Um, they were told at the time that they could do nothing. This was a British army detachment. And indeed, uh, when members of the detachment said they were going to fire the guns, uh, these were artillery light guns, to try and deter the Serb forces moving on the city, they were told that the cost of the shells, and the shells cost some 25,000 pounds, will be taken from their salaries if they did so. Uh, there were shameful absences shameful failures to act at the time, not only by the West, and of course the in, uh, utmost responsibility comes with those people who committed the crimes, but there were shameful, shameful failures uh, by our own country and other countries where we could have done more to seek to prevent this. Uh, but what I want to speak about I, is, um, is how this, I think, plays into genocide in Europe and, and the continuing memory of the Holocaust. Because the Holocaust, as mentioned before, we said afterwards that uh, it could never be allowed to happen again. And yet it did, and many of the same things that happened in the run-up to, to events in Yugoslavia are happening again, uh, and Councillor Ashby mentioned many of them. I would add that we have the terrifying possibility of the new Italian government asking for a census solely on Romani people, solely so they can be checked. Those were the sorts of things that were done in Yugoslavia in order to uh, to ready the way for a genocide, and they need to count people and identify them. And there were the same things done to Jews and to Romani in uh, Nazi-controlled areas to allow those people to be exterminated. And that Nazi genocide extended also into Yugoslavia, and that's why we want to speak on briefly with members' forbearance. Because there was a thriving Jewish community in Bosnia, and Bosnia actually to this day has a fantastic cosmopolitan environment, and Sarajevo is one of the places I've been most happy and most welcomed as a Jewish person to visit now, and does fantastic work for its Jewish community now, but it once had a thriving and large Jewish community. And that Jewish community um, uh, were mostly people who had escaped from Spain when the Christian government there uh, threw them out, and they took with them an incredibly important historical artifact called the Sarajevo Haggadah. The Haggadah is the story of Passover, Passover being the escape of Jewish people from, from slavery, and they'd escape and escaped from their oppression to Bosnia and had taken with them this historical relic. During the Second World War, when the Nazis uh, came to Sarajevo, they sought to take that artifact from the Jewish people, from the Bosnian people, and, and to take it away. It was the, the sacrifice of a Bosnian Muslim man, Dervish Korkut, that saved that. Uh, and he not only saved that, but he himself saved a Jewish child. 
And many, many people in the Bosnian Muslim community did similar things, and almost all of the Bosnian Jewish community were smuggled out uh, and were hidden in the Albanian mountains, and, which is why the vast majority of that community survived. And unfortunately, the, the place I bear heritage from, Lithuania, uh, almost all of that community died because their neighbors, instead of helping them to escape, uh, turned on them and murdered them themselves. And there was a fantastic, huge amount of work done by Bosnians to save Jews. And that's why, as Jews, and as everyone, but particularly for me as a Jewish person, we do need to remember that genocide and remember that we allowed it to happen. And as part of recognizing the Holocaust, we have to remember Srebrenica. And I would echo the remarks made earlier by Councillor Schofield that survivors have been fantastic at speaking in Holocaust memorial events and fantastic at continuing to push forward and say that this can never be allowed to happen to anyone ever again. I'm tremendously proud to support this motion. Thank you, Councillor Avery. Councillor Haddad? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I want to thank Councillor Shatwell for bringing this motion to highlight how we were all horrified at the appalling genocide in Srebrenica. This was a town which was supposedly under the protection of the UN and serves as an example how even in the 20th century, interracial conflict and ethnic cleansing continues to shock us with their violence and complete disregard of human rights. It's important to note that while there were other towns and villages where similar examples of brutal, shocking behavior took place, Srebrenica was especially horrifying because of the actions of the Dutch UN troops, as Councillor Avery mentioned, and they abandoned their ordinance and left the townsfolk to the viciousness of the Serbs and their Chetnik supporters. And I'm sure everyone in this chamber celebrated when Radko Mladic was jailed for life for his actions at that time. Uh, and personally, I've been able to thank Paddy Ashdown for the way he handled that and ensured that those war criminals were brought to justice. Um, the trauma of this conflict actually affected everyone which I was able to witness and treat at first hand. And we ha also had former Dutch troops who suffered breakdowns, then came to work for NGOs as a way of expiating their guilt and reparation for their actions. The Dutch nation has apologized for their part in the genocide, as did the UN. Only Serbia failed to recognize it as such, but did refer to it as a massacre. Then a few years later, mowed down dozens of men and boys in the massacre at Ratchak. These ethnic conflicts destroyed communities and polarized opinion, but it wasn't all one-sided. We lived in a Muslim village, but during the spells of shelling, when we all cowered uh, on the stairwell, we had medicines, baby incubators, and theatre equipment stolen from our UN vehicles. The headmaster of a school in a place called Sansky Mosque, which was trashed, the whole place was trashed. He had been a Muslim who'd married a Serb woman who had taken her son away uh, when he was a teenager. And he got word that his son was with the Serb forces outside his village. The village was protected by French troops at the time. And the word was that his son, who was now in the Serb forces, would be forced to put his father on his knees and to be shot through the head. And he said, if they'd ever got through, I would also have to do that to my son. And that's how dreadful the whole thing was. And he told me he'd never even killed a chicken before this conflict, but he's dreamed every night of blood and that was what he saw, blood. There were also Muslim fighters from the Middle East who came and issued a fatwa on all British people. And I had to be snuck into the local hospital in Travnik 
um, at the bottom of a van so that I could go and help a lovely New Zealand doctor called Dr. Brown set up an ITU in the basement. Um, the interesting thing is, I took our team up to a place called Du Bois to participate in um, a WHO program to vaccinate children against polio. Um, and the, these Middle Eastern fighters knew who I was and didn't mind that I treated their children and gave them vaccinations. I would love to tell you a lot more about things that went on, but I can see that I've got a, a red light. Um, but I have no problem with going to visit Bosnia. You can see the bullet-ridden buildings that are still there, the bullet-ridden streets, etc. if you do go. Um, and I, only I also want to praise the teams of volunteers who are still digging up bodies for identification. It's an awful job, but there are volunteers who are still doing this. Um, but to finalise, to say, there are other conflicts going on. Look at Rwanda between the Houthis and Tutis where millions were killed. Kosovo, two million displaced. And more recently in Myanmar with the Rohingya people and in the Yemen, which is facing mass starvation, which is why I say it's fine to remember Srebrenica, but it's also fine to remember all the other refugees that we've had and the Holocaust Memorial Day. Thank you. I now call on Councillor Chartwell to reply. Uh, thanks so much for, for all of the comments. Um, thanks to Councillor Huddard for sharing those stories and reminding us that it's always important to look at wider genocides and to remember Rwanda and the plight of the Rohingya. And to also remind us that, that, that Srebrenica was supposedly under the protection of the UN. Um, thanks to Councillor Asprey to, for reminding us that there are still the perpetrators of war crimes out there and that justice, the fight for justice continues. Thanks to Councillor Avery for, for reflecting on the failures, failures of our own country and others to prevent this and to talk really so eloquently about the continuing impact of the Holocaust and of course the danger of history repeating itself and for mentioning that the, the Romanies in Italy, um, we might also add the far right in Croatia as, as well and that kind of real danger um, that history may repeat itself very, very close um, to Bosnia. Um, and also just to remind us about um, the neighbourhoods helping each other um, and the fact that Bosnia was so well integrated um, before the ethnic cleansing was imposed and how Muslims and Jewish communities and neighbours helped each other and worked together. Um, and I'd like to thank Councillor Sch Schofield um, for, for talking about the mothers of Srebrenica and just reminding us how much women were used as a weapon of war and the importance of what can be achieved if women come together as a collective voice. And also to remind us about Newcastle being a city of sanctuary and the important work that the council um, does um, in terms of not tolerating hate crimes, including those against refugees, asylum seekers and migrants. Um, so thanks so much for the strength of opinion of, uh, about this important anniversary. And um, I guess it's all about remembering the horrors of the past so that they won't be repeated. So I'd like to move the motion. Thank you very much. Is this notice of motion agreed? Please. Thank you. At this point, the last bit for 20 minutes, uh, move that we suspend standing order 19 uh, so that we can complete the business that's on the, the agenda paper tonight. Okay. okay. Does council agree that? Uh, no. So we need to to vote then on that. <laughs> the motion to suspend standing orders is lost, so we continue with with business as usual.
next item is item number 13, the impact on the North East of leaving the European Union. I call on Councillor Taylor to move the motion and seconded by Councillor Ashby. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Two years ago, the UK court voted by a small margin to leave the EU. People voted for many reasons, but at the time, few people really knew the details of what leaving the EU might mean, particularly for our region. Two years on from the referendum, we're not much further forward. The government is in total disarray, with the Tory party lurching from crisis to crisis as they try to pander to the Moglodites on the right, while start trying to stop the pro-Remain Tories from putting their country before their party. And in the meantime, the government is failing to tackle the issues that matter to people in the North East. The NHS, social care, education, housing, environmental sustainability and employment. So what a splendid opportunity for Her Majesty's opposition to make the case for avoiding the biggest strategic mistake this country has ever made. As both Phil Wilson, the MP for Sedgefield, and Keir Starmer have said, the country voted on the principle of leaving, not the terms. The detail is therefore important. Unfortunately, the Labour leadership has totally failed to show real leadership on this issue, either tamely leading MPs to vote with the government or ordering Labour MPs and peers to abstain on crucial votes. We are delighted that so many Labour peers have ignored this advice, but seeing Labour MPs split three ways last week on a vote to stay in the EEA must have left the Tories laughing all the way home. Of course, the reason for the Labour Party's appalling performances in opposition is that they are also split down the middle on how to proceed. If Jeremy Corbyn had fought the referendum campaign with even a fraction of the energy and enthusiasm he displayed in last year's election, we wouldn't be in this mess we are now. But then Jeremy Corbyn doesn't really believe in the EU, so perhaps it's not surprising he's shown so little leadership on the issue. In contrast, we applaud the courage of North East Labour MPs, Catherine McKinnell, Bridget Phillipson, Phil Wilson, Paul Williams and Anna Turley, who have broken ranks with De Jeremy Corbyn by agreeing that voters should be given a, a final say on the Brexit deal. Writing in The Independence, the MPs said, how do we decide if the deal we are offered on Brexit is the right one for the North East? Will it be good enough for the exporters who provide so many of the jobs on which our regional economy depends? Companies such as Nissan in Sunderland, Hitachi in County Durham, and those in the chemical processing industries on Teesside provide thousands of jobs and see their future as part of the EU customs union and single market. We would hate to see the growth and employment opportunities they offer be undermined by a so bad deal. They state that the outcome of the negotiations will affect the northeast of England and the UK for decades to come. Perhaps because this is so important, they believe the British people should have their say on the final Brexit deal. We agree with them. So did the 100,000 people who marched through London last Saturday for the people's vote. So why will the North East be so badly affected by leaving the EU? We are a manufacturing and exporting region. The North East is expected to experience a particular impact as a result of its disproportionately large trading relationship with the European Union in manufacturing. Many thousands of jobs, around 150,000 in the North East, depend on exporting to our European partners. Leaving the EU's single market, which is the world's largest free trade zone, would hit our trade and investment and increase unemployment. Because we make things, this region actually had a positive balance of trade. No longer. We have huge supply chains in support of our manufacturing. The northeast of England simply cannot afford the cost of Brexit. It's a massive own goal, disrupting our economy and the livelihoods of very many households. The many foreign, inv in foreign onward investment projects that came to the northeast have also been put at risk. Why would an overseas company seeking to expand in the EU want to put itself outside the single market, facing tariff barriers to its exports? The warnings from Hitachi and Nelson should have been taken seriously. They want us to be in the single market, and their views matter profoundly. The North East needs the jobs and prosperity they bring, yet the latest figures show that investment in the car industry has halved in the last 12 months, likely due to anxiety surrounding Brexit. Nationally, first Airbus, then BMW, and now Honda have warned of the dire consequences of a no-deal Brexit and the continued lack of clarity of the UK government's position on customs and regulatory alignment. It's no longer project fear, but dawning reality. The North East Brexit Group, which comprises business groups, unions, universities and charities, including the North East LEP, the North East England Chamber of Commerce, the region's four universities and the North East Combined Authority, was formed to provide a collective voice for the region in the Brexit negotiations. Its recent report is based on evidence from a wide range of government, academic and business sources. The report says that the UK must ensure that it retains access to the single market, have an open trading regime, 
and maintain uh, a stable regulatory framework with the EU to minimise the impact, impact of Brexit on the North East economy. The report highlighted widespread concerns across the region's business community about future trading relationships and added to previous warnings that the North East stands to lose the most from Brexit, with the region's key automotive and pharmaceutical sectors particularly at risk. And there's already evidence that business confidence in digital and transport sectors has been affected with some decisions having been made to locate investment in Europe rather than in the North East, and evidence that some new business contracts have not been won as buyers have chosen to work with EU-based partners. So why won't the Labour Party leadership join the Liberal Democrats, the Green Party and many Labour MPs and peers in calling for a referendum on the final deal with the option of staying in the EU if the deal is unacceptable? We're told it's not democratic, that the people made their choice. But the vote was close and people voted for many different re reasons. Saying we can't ask them to change their minds is like saying we shouldn't try to persuade people who voted Tory in the last general election to vote differently next time. If it was democratic to reverse a referendum result from 40 years ago, why is it undemocratic to try to reverse a decision from two years ago? In October, there will be a deal presented to Parliament. No more lies, no more unrealistic assumptions, no more wishful thinking. People in the North East and elsewhere will know exactly what Brexit means. They have the right then to decide if they agree with the deal or to prefer to remain in the EU. They deserve a referendum on the final deal. Please support the motion. Councillor Ashby. Mayor, uh, the effect of leaving the European Union may be little, little short of catastrophic for funding for new commercial infrastructure and housing projects in the region. While the government has given assurances that existing projects will continue, fine words about the future butter no parsnips. 64% of our capital funding streams for the period to 2021, totaling almost three quarters of a billion pounds, is supposed to come from the EU. Will they be replaced? Our specialist agents, agencies very much doubt it. Close to home, in his report to our April meeting, Councillor Bell described a number of important projects in the city part funded by the European Social Fund or the European Regional Development Fund. But I'd like to focus on one often overlooked aspect of Bre Brexit, that we will lose access to the European Investment Bank, the EIB. This risks a lasting negative impact on investment in our communities, including reducing the number of homes that can be built. The EIB typically offers a cheaper long-term source of finance than is available from many private equivalents and is often willing to invest in slightly higher risk projects than many commercial lenders while providing greater protection to the public element of the investment. Already there has been a significant decline in those seeking EIB support for investing in UK infrastructure. Only 39 deals with the UK collectively worth just under 3.1 billion euros have been finalised since the referendum. In the 18 months before, there were 74 deals, collectively worth over four times as much, 13.5 billion euros. The UK's share of EIB loans was 10% when the Liberal Democrats were in government, but fell to 4% last year. When the British Business Bank launched the Northern Powerhouse Investment Fund, the EIB provided 184 million out of 400 million to channel through local enterprise partnerships. This money is earmarked for microfinance up to £10,000, for loans up to £750,000, and for equity investments up to £2 million. What happens when this pot is empty? Other examples of EIB investment included the Housing Finance Corporation, which secured a €1 billion Euro loan from the EIB to expand the affordable housing finance programme to build over 20,000 affordable homes across the North and elsewhere. We echo the LGA's call to the government to provide immediate guarantees that equivalent lending alternatives will be made available for councils and SMEs and for the government to allow councils to self-finance new homes, lift the housing borrowing cap and to allow councils to use 100% of the receipts and the right to buy sales to invest in new homes. And better yet, exit from Brexit. I second the motion. Thank you, Councillor Aspey. I will now call on Councillor Forbes to move an amendment, seconded by Councillor Driscoll. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I had the opportunity to go as part of a delegation of core city leaders earlier in the year to go meet Michel Barnier. 
uh, the EU chief negotiator in Brussels. And I came away with a number of uh, impressions from that which I think are worth reflecting on because they're not part of the normal discourse of debate in this country around Brexit and the EU. Firstly, I think we don't understand fully that the EU see this very much as a legal challenge. And one of the problems that we have in negotiating the current exit deal is contradictory and often conflicting statements from government and government, individual government ministers which set out broad areas of principle or aim to set out broad areas of principle but which then find are virtually impossible to translate into the legal framework that the EU requires of us. And that's one of the reasons why the negotiations are going, I think, so badly. I was also struck and very much reminded that the greatest achievement of the EU has not actually been prosperity. Relating back to the previous motion, I think the most significant achievement of the EU has been peace in Europe for the last 70 years. And by making sure that the countries of Europe and the regions of Europe don't march against each other in war, the EU has achieved a great deal in human civilization, in my view. And then we have where we are now in terms of the Brexit negotiations. I hadn't fully appreciated until I uh, spoke to Mr. Barnier that six months of the two-year period from triggering, uh, triggering Article 50 has to be set aside for individual parliaments of the nations and regions in the EU to agree whatever deal is reached, which means that a deal has to be reached by October this year. I have to say, I am really concerned that we will not end up with a deal and that some ministers in government are actively preparing the ground and indeed many right-wing politicians on the Tory party would actively prefer us to leave the EU without a trade deal. We know that that will be hugely damaging to us here in the region. We know that we are the region of England which has a balance of trade surplus. We know that from leaked documents we are the region of England which is worst hit, both in a no-deal scenario and in a deal scenario. Whatever the outcome of Brexit is in the negotiations, the North East will be hit economically. And yet the government fails to engage with political leaders. It fails, despite the promises that they make, to come and talk to us in a meaningful way about the impact of Brexit and how we can help to mitigate it here in our region. We have to accept that there was a vote and a national vote and different parts of the country voted in different ways. I'm proud that we as a party campaigned in Newcastle for Remain and I'm proud that we helped to achieve that Remain vote in the city. But we also have to recognise that not everywhere voted in that way either. And we also have to, I think, condemn the current government for the absolutely cack-handed and inept way that they are negotiating the current deal. That means, Lord Mayor, that we have a choice. And the preference on this side is that we have a government which will negotiate a good deal for us, which will stick to the agreements around workers' rights, which will stick to the agreements around free trade, which will stick to the agreements around a customs union, which will, in short, seek to protect and preserve and increase the prosperity of this country and the people who work here, not what we're getting under the current government, a government which is seeking to diminish rights, to diminish prosperity, and a Brexit which is simply going to work for the few and not the many. And that's why, Lord Mayor, I think we should write to the Secretary of State for Dexu with our concerns. I think we should request a meeting. I think the House of Commons should have a meaningful vote on the final outcome. But above all, we need a vote of the people in this country to elect a government which will act in their interests, not just the interests of the wealthy few who are pushing the no-deal agenda in the current government. And we need a government which will deliver a better deal for Britain and a better deal for this city. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Driscoll. May I formally move this, uh, second this amendment and uh, reserve the right to speak, please, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Frew.
Thank you, Lord Mayor. So the reason for supporting this amendment and the issue with the motion as it is, is that when you're asking for something, firstly, you ask nicely, but secondly, you have to be specific. And the motion asks for a vote. That's not a meaningful request. Because a vote could be a referendum, some kind of vote on um, different options, or a general election. And so why referendum would not be a preferable option is that people are given the choice between either what terrible um, deal that the current government are trying to negotiate, or chaos. And Brexit is a very wide issue that needs to be discussed in terms of an economic agenda that can only be done in a general election where it can be linked to the issues that Councillor Taylor has raised. The issues that, uh, about the way that it affects the National Health Service, the way that it affects our economy. But it's worth uh, mentioning that there are other things that are impacting um, uh, the NHS and uh, the economy, things that have been around long before the vote in 2016 and came up during the um, Condemn coalition. And so I support the amendment um, and support my colleagues who say that we should have a um, general election uh, and that is the meaningful way forwards um, to present a holistic opportunity for people to vote for uh, an actual option rather than to say I'm on one side or the other on this topic. Thank you, Councillor Fruit. Another maiden speech, and many this evening. Well done. The guillotine has fallen, um, so uh, Councillor Driscoll, are you reserved the right to speak first, um, and then Councillor Taylor can have the right to reply. Thank you, Lord Mayor. There is no doubt that Brexit will have a, a very serious economic impact on our future. Cooperation with our European partners is essential, not just in trade, but in environmental protection academic collaborations through our universities, cross-border security, such as the European Arrest Warrant, and in upholding human rights. But the problem with the referendum was that it was ill-considered and ill-defined. Were we voting for a different kind of partnership, or were we turning our backs on our closest neighbours? Were we intending to retain friction-free trade, or were we hoping to engage in protectionism? The ambiguity of the question has caused all the problems since. We've had two years since the referendum vote, and we still don't know what the Conservative government are asking for. What's the border plan in Ireland? What's the trade plan for services? Are we after a general trade deal or a sectoral deal? What will be the implementation period? When will it end? And what will happen in the event of no deal? We've only got three months until the process of drawing up this legislation begins. No one in this chamber, I think, believes that we're going to have a clear answer by October of what the exit deal will be. A second referendum will repeat the mistakes of the first. We can't just have a vote that simply says we don't like the result of the first one, so let's have another. So a referendum would have to be on a specific proposal. But none of us here knows if we'll even have a clear proposal to put on a ballot paper. The specifics, the timescales, and the backstops will be changing continually. You cannot hold a referendum on that basis. But it's not just Brexit that threatens the people of Newcastle. Since 2012, we've seen £283 million of cuts or unfunded cost pressures slashing our budgets voted in by the coalition government. We've seen the rollout of universal credit making it impossible for many people in our city to meet their ends. We've seen an alarming rise of in-work poverty with working people needing to visit food banks just to feed their children. And all of this austerity was happening even before we had the Brexit referendum, much of it voted in by the coalition government. So the answer to these problems is to hold a general election, give the people a chance to elect a party that conduct the Brexit negotiations seriously and guarantee their jobs, their human rights and their public services. Thank you.
Councillor Taylor. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you to those who con contributed to the debate. Um, Councillor Ashby very uh, sensibly reminded us of the importance of the European Investment Bank. And Councillor Forbes reminded us of the great achievement of the EU in keeping peace in Europe for the last 70 years and that the damage that would be caused by no deal, or even, as he admitted, a good deal for the North East. I actually hate referenda. I think it's an appalling way of, uh, of getting a, a, a decision. But we had a referendum, and unfortunately, I believe the only way to reverse that referendum is to have another one. And it would be a very clear question. Do you accept the deal that has been negotiated by the Conservative government, or would you rather stay in the EU? That's a simple question. People would know the details. They have the right to, to do that. And what is the Labour Party offering in, instead? We'll write to the Secretary of State. OK, right, they're not going to take any notice. We'll have a meaningful vote in the House of Commons on the final deal. Well, that's just been defeated in the House of Commons. And when it call for a general election, well, a general election will only take place when the government loses a vote of confidence. It's not very likely at the moment um, that the Remainers are too frightened of that happening to, to uh, really fight against, what they, against Theresa May and what, for what they believe in. So it's not going to happen. And even if it did, we're asked to vote for a party that will, let us, that will take us over the cliff a little bit more gently than the party that's in power at the moment. It's not realistic. Everything that's said in the motion is completely negated by the final point on your amendment, which says that you will negotiate the terms of the EU's exit from the EU um, less, in a less damaging manner. Whatever the way we leave the EU, it will damage the North East and damage it for decades to come. We don't accept that. You shouldn't either. Before going to the vote, can I apologise, Councillor Driscoll, for not congratulating you on your maiden speech as well. Sorry. Okay, uh, there seems to be some division. Um, can we vote on the amendment to this notice of motion, please? Oh, uh, sorry, I've... Yep, okay. Okay, that, that, that amendment is, is carried. So, uh, can we vote on the motion as, as amended? As agreed? No? Okay, can we vote on that then, please? So the motion, as amended, is carried. We need to deal with the remaining items of business in accordance with Standard or Standing Order 19. Can I ask, um, first of all, Councillor Stone, do you wish to have this uh, motion uh, voted on or, or dealt with at this meeting, or how do? Okay. Councillor Cott, could I ask about a notice of motion number on um, item 15? Yes, sir. I could like to go back to the next meeting. Next meeting, okay. Councillor John Paul Stevenson, do you wish this to be considered this evening or? Uh, deal with tonight and the P Pardon? Deal with tonight and the board of Thank you. Okay. It is. Yeah, is, who was seconding? Sorry, it was Councillor Durrant. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, is that agreed? agreed? Okay. Thank you. Um, you may have noticed that again, although minor today, we've had a couple of problems with the voting equipment and projectors in the chamber. Officers are actually looking at options 
on um, getting something a bit more efficient and um, 21st century, I think the, this was installed in 1999, our, our equipment here. Um, we, the members, will be kept updated on the progress of finding better option of, other than using what we have at the moment. And um, we will be notified what will be put in place in time for our next meeting on the 5th of September. Uh, can I just have, uh, before closing, a couple of notes to give you? Can I remind members to carry their ID cards and security fobs with them at all times when in the Civic, please? Especially uh, important now with so many different uh, doors which you can get in one place and aren't, some aren't secure. Also, you'll find that uh, outside the council chamber there are two fundraising collection tubs for the two, two charities that I'm supporting and promoting during my uh, year of office. Action Foundation and Moving Forward. For colleagues who were unable to be at the annual meeting and the Lord Mayor's Church service that followed, this is your chance to be especially show your support tonight. There are also leaflets for you to take away to help you know more about the charities that I'm supporting. So thank you very much uh, for your attendance. Let's uh, declare the meeting closed. Thank you.